Okay, let me start that all over again. Uh, I'd like to call this public forum to order. This is for the Wellington School Building Committee, January the 26th at 6.32. We have our entire committee here for and one on the line, I believe. Chris, are you there? Okay. Um, our chairman is enjoying some family time down in Florida, so he won't be here, but he did ask me to read this comment uh, to everyone. And I will start this again. I have tried it once, but you know. All right. I will not be able to attend tonight. I realize that this is bad timing, and I apologize. I'm at a family function that, despite my plans, could not be modified. This family commitment is very important, and I must honor it. Thank you for participating, and please continue to support the work of this committee through your involvement as we work towards decisions that will shape our town's future for 5,200 years. Sincerely, Mike. So, and then now we'll get going. Let's, let's get up. I'll, I'll try and run through a bit of an overview of the entire process. We have um, spent almost uh, two years going through this. We have what is essentially two options one is a new school, one is a reconfiguration of this school which is uh, much more than a renovation. It, it's really much more invasive as far as what's going to remain. Um, and it involves an addition and uh, um, work inside the building here. For each of those two, there is an option to add an auditorium, which brings us to a total, depending on how you want to look at it, as four options. Um, one option, and it is not up to us, <laughs> is, um, to continue on with what we have, and that will be, determ be determined by the voters in the town, the taxpayers in the town of Wellington are up to So, um, we have some boards up for you to check out. If you haven't had the opportunity, please do so. As far as how we're going to run this tonight, I, I am not a fan of time limits, but I not have a lot of patience for. Um, reiteration, uh, repeating yourself, uh, uh, going off on tangents. You need to stay on point about the topic um, with respect to the, what we're going to do for school facility and the impacts of that. What we, we want to hear from you tonight. This is not our show for you as much as it is for you um, to uh, respond, to, to, to offer your thoughts on what makes sense for this town. So we're here more to listen and answer questions than we are to tell you what we're going to do. Because quite frankly, we have not made a decision yet. We will not make a decision until next week. Hopefully, all will go well. Uh, as far as time limits, we have a sign-up sheet. What we like to do is alternate between in-person and online. And if I can get that, First sign up sheet in front of me, what I want to do is um, not only call the person to speak, but I also want to line up the next couple of speakers so that we, we can save a little bit of time so people don't have to walk down from the top row in the bleachers uh, to get to the microphone. We have a microphone at the podium. You really do need to get close to the mic like I'm having to deal with here so far. Don't, don't be shy. Okay. Um, anyone from the committee have anything they'd like to add? Okay. And for for those folks who are attending via Zoom, we we do need to see you either wave your hand or, or um, put up your virtual hand if you know how to do that. There's a little button down the bottom of the screen. I'm familiar from that side of the uh, screen doing that stuff. So, um, anyway, back to the committee. Anyone have anything they'd like to add at this point? Otherwise, we're going to get started. So, our first speaker uh, is from here is John Blessington. And do we have someone on the line that wants to speak? We'll get, get them uh, in the queue. John, the mic is all yours. Sorry. 
John Lessington, 29 Mason Road. I uh, spoke at a meeting a little over a week ago, and I don't think I made a lot of friends with it, but I spoke uh, truth. My uh, conclusion at that meeting was that this committee has not reached its goal, which was to find the best um, solution for the problem we're having with K through eight in town. And instead, all this has been doing is to sell a plot of land to the town. There's been a lot of conflicts of interest and uh, really no choice. It started out, it was, the only choice was we're gonna build a new school on the land and just get a couple of people on the Many who came out with a plan to renovate the uh, whole school. Well, anyway, this is where we stand now. So as to the plan, we're having a meeting tonight, which is more or less a charade. I don't know of anybody who expects that we're going to get any uh, answer next week, any decision other than to build a school uh, on the new, on the a new school on a piece of property. Uh, of course, people are saying, well, we have these two choices. Since when do you give people two choices and then make the decision yourself? That doesn't make any sense. I know a lot of people who would like the Hall School. I'm sure there are people who would like the Shinsky property as well. But you're going to ask us to speak then you're going to go home and you're going to come Tuesday. And I mean, I'm looking for why. Tuesday, you come out and find the hall school, which is my preference, of course. Then I'm going to have to go down to the next board of selectmen meeting and get down on my knees and beg forgiveness. But I don't think that's going to happen. My suggestion is, and I think you can do this, you're the committee, you can do anything you want. Call for a uh, instead of choosing a school, call for an advisory referendum. Bring it before the people, give them the choice of which, of which choice they want. And then I would feel at least better that uh, this was being done correctly. Thank you. Thank you, John. Do we have anyone on the one? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Next, uh, is Alicia Corsini. My name is Alicia Corsini. I live at 732 River Road. I have been in town since 1966. This has been the hardest thing I've ever done gone through, more so than the gun range, more so than the warehouse. This will put me out of town. These taxes on top of my triple light bill and the double to heat my house will put me out of town. I have been a longtime resident. I have given, and my family has given so much to this town from the Easter egg, to playing the bunny. My father did the bunny. Now I do it to now I'll be forced out of town. You people were tasked with finding the best solution for the school. All you did was look at the options for new or renovate. What about just making some repairs for now and waiting a little bit until we have a more stable economy? The only options you're giving us are spending $60 million. It's too much. Not in this time. Not right now. Everything's so unstable. And I have a couple of other questions. One, this QR code that you sent out for people to do surveys, anybody can do that survey from a six-year-old kid to somebody who doesn't live in town. How did you manage that? Well, I think Phil is managing that. Would you care to speak to how we're going to keep an eye on that, Phil? You want me to just say that we have a paper copy too that anybody can fill out? I mean, it's, I think it's the no, same thing. That's not what I'm saying. How are you managing that it's just people who can vote in the town that it's, are voting for this? It's not. So it, the 300 kids that go to school can do that survey. Sure. And that's fair. They have, this they don't pay it. 
They don't pay the bills. How are they going to pay for the school? Why would they have the option? I understand your point. And, and okay. I think that you point is the next to, point. To be able to, 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 to debate that at this juncture is probably um, not very productive. So, um, okay, the next question. We spent how many thousands of dollars for the engineering of that Wachensky property? Does that fund come back to us if we don't use it? Does the, do the dollars come back to us or does the information lead from that come back to us? Both. If they, because I'm going to tell you something, they're going to get the information. That's not going to be a problem. If they want to sell this property after we've paid for all of that, they, they're going to get it. They can't not get it. As far as the cost, that's borne by rules and tax boards. So we lost that money. That, that's a fair statement. How much did that cost? I don't have the numbers at the tip of my fingertips. Um, Anyone got a handle on that error or you want? But we'll find out. I'm, I'm really requesting that the, the board, the committee, look back at not having just these two options. Bring something that's a little bit more cost effective to us because you're going to run a lot of people out of town. I just wanted to add. Uh, just to put things in perspective, it wasn't just uh, research on a new school new site. All of the work that we've done here as a committee and the taxpayer dollars that were spent and authorized to this committee were spent on both properties, both areas, Hall School, all the investigation that we did here, all the environmental, all of the investigations, the space planning, all of that that was done is also information that we're using. So it wasn't just an investigation. I that. Was, okay. I just want to point that out. Let's look at just staying where they are. Because if you guys go with a different school, then it's going to be money for, oh, well, now we want to turn center school into a town hall. There's, it's going to be a never ending open pocket, and we just can't do it. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, if there's anyone online who would you know, care to uh, uh, speak at this point, uh, please please raise your hand or wave at the screen or do something so we know. If not, we will go to the lane newcom. After Elaine with the uh, Jim Gilling, so you can be prepared. Hi, um, my name is Elaine Newcomb. I live at 28 Fermier Road. I've been a resident in Willington since 1972, homeowner since 75. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of study, a lot of focus on the school exactly. But the town government owes the taxpayers a comprehensive view of immediate and anticipated costs to the town other than just the school. There are impending costs for the work to correct the drainage on Schofield Road. And um, the study came up with an estimate that there's probably upwards of a million dollars. We authorized money for the study. Um, the beta group's report on uh, the roads estimated costs of 800,000 to $1 million per year for town road work to keep roads in good shape and certainly um, maintenance uh, provide, uh, prevents disaster. I understand that. And also emergency services and fire protection plus are anticipated. Anybody who's gone to the town meetings knows there's a laundry list of a lot of things, just like every household um, that the town needs to buy. We're presented with estimates of costs for building four scenarios, particularly with a new site on the Wisensky property, the infrastructure costs for water, power, septic, site development are guesses at this point, particularly whether the site can provide sufficient acceptable water. Reimbursement from the state will not cover any costs off-site, including road improvement. The yearly projected savings um, 
of approximately $500,000 a year in operating costs to consolidate to one school does not cover ongoing costs to the town regarding the closure of center school and ongoing maintenance there. Roofing costs for Hall School may be a town responsibility even if we choose to build a new school because the roofing project was not done in 2020 and just patching was done instead. So I would request and expect at this point that the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance, I know this is very early in the budget season, but that's kind of the, a lot of the information the taxpayers need to look at the, the, look at the big picture in terms of affordability. I would expect that the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance need to provide taxpayers with a multi-year projection of increases in taxes, taxes for both the school and municipal budgets and the anticipated adjustments um, from the 2024 reassessment, which is coming up in another year. It's being delayed one year. I have copies. I have a copy for each of the committees, school building committee, um, selected, and thank you. Thank you. No Yes, Mr. Billick is up next. Um, Jim Billick, 12 Morrow Drive. Um, I'm not speaking uh, on behalf of the board of selectmen, I'm just speaking on behalf of myself, a concerned resident of Willington. Um, I've known the Willington people uh, to be very generous. Regularly passed budgets where 70% of it goes towards our schools. But I'm thinking at this point in time, given based with these two choices before us, we're asking Wellington uh, taxpayers to basically pay up 10 to 16, 17 mils extra based on your numbers that I see, um, based on your finance uh, committee reports. Uh, that's a huge, that's only in the first six years. That's way more than the $500,000 in operating cost savings you will see by reducing down to one school. Um, I would strongly suggest that you do some type of discounted cash flow analysis to see what you're actually will cost townspeople. Run the bond schedule out for 20 years and see what it's really going to cost. Because as a former member and chair of the Board of Finance, I'm concerned we're going to run out of air in our capital programs. There's a lot of things that was touched upon. Schofield Road, we're probably due for another fire truck because we have one of those every 10 years. It's at least $800,000 to a million dollars of road repairs that are coming that will probably need to be bonded out anyways. So something like this, a project of this magnitude at this time, uh, given the economy right now is just very unreasonable. You're asking townspeople, hey, what do you want to pay, an arm or a leg? There should be other choices available, uh, other reasonable choices for our town, uh, given the fact that Wellington is a poorer town than our neighbors of Tolland and Mansfield. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone on the line here to speak at this point? No. Amazing. Uh, Mr. Maloney, you are next. Thank you. Um, Richard Maloney, Six Marco Road. Uh, my concern is uh, leaving Hall Memorial School free kids. Uh, if you build a new school, You'll leave that school vacant. There's no plan uh, for the school currently uh, in your proposal. And I hate to see that school left vacant and deteriorating and abandoned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maloney. Just to uh, touch on that, um, the, the, the deed for Hall School, of course, has a decision clause. If we stop using it as a school, back to the Hall Foundation. Uh, this committee is only tasked with making a recommendation as to what conceivable use 
this building and its property be put to. Um, but we are not, unfortunately, tasked with the financial impact of such a decision. So uh, that, that, of course, would become a concern for everyone in this town. Okay, moving on to um, Sharon Perot. And I would ask that you at least state your name and address when you speak. Uh, good evening, Shannon Burbo, 188 Bouchon Road. Uh, thanks for all sharing. I'm also a lifelong resident of Bloomington. My children attended both schools, as did I. And it sounds like I'm the first one to stand here in front of you and say that while nostalgia is wonderful, and I am very proud of my little town, all of the things that it brings and holds together as a community, it's time for a new school. We have deferred this for a very long time. I sat in my son's fifth grade classroom and it looked exactly the way it did when I was there. I won't tell you how many years passed in between, but it was too many. I understand the impact that this will have on our town. I understand and have heard in many of the meetings that many people desire to allow folks in our community to age in place and that they cannot absorb the impact that this will be. However, that is a very granular look at a very large concept that it's time for our time, our, our town to tackle. As being a member of a community, I am responsible for all of the things in the community and I need to support all of the pieces. I need to support the senior center, even though I don't go there. I need to support the library, although I don't really have the opportunity to use it. I wake up every morning and I hope that I don't need the fire department or the ambulance to come and take care of my family, but I will support them if they come and they say that they need something to operate. Our kids need this to operate. It's time for us to invest in education. We haven't done that for a very long time. We talk about passing budgets that support education. I sat on the Board of Education 20 years ago, and even then we were expected to come in every single year with a minimal increase. Those increases always included things like insurance going up, gas going up. That is true today and I understand that. However, it is time for us to take a step back as a town and realize it's time to invest in education and it is time to invest in our children. Thank you. Thank you. Stella. Following that will be Matt Clark. And Nick, Nick Stella, 49. Um, I just want to start off, I think everyone in town wants better for the kids. I don't think that's the be. I think it's the procedure and the process that we go. I personally hope to see no order on both of them. Um, but <clears throat> that being said, there's more options than just these two. Obviously tonight when I'm talking about upgrading, or we talk about a new or redoing all of all, but there is a third option. And people do need to know that. So, uh, you know, I understand what you got to look after the kids and everything, but we also have to look after the people in town that are stuck on fixed incomes or lower income. You know, fortunately, there's many people that are financially stable and are able to take up $400, $300 more a year in taxes, but there's people that can't take that. Inflation is continuing to go up. Wages are not meeting that. And people, you know, 40% of the people are, or some studies, 40% of the people are living off their credit cards right now. I think we really need to consider all people, not just the kids, because we can still do right for the kids by doing upgrades. Um, that being said, I understand the charge for the SBC is to find a pre K to eight building. Um, my question is, who or whom are the people that created the SBC? Who created the school building committee? Correct. Um, the, the charge was um, formulated by the board of select. And uh, I think with the board of ed. There was, yes, there was a, uh, would you care to embellish that? There was actually a vote at town meeting to create a school building committee. Okay. And where did the regulations 
or rules within the SBC come about where there cannot be a change in the charge? There's no such problem. Okay, so the SBC could vote to expand the charge, correct? That could have been a choice some time ago, certainly. Okay, so it could have happened before. Why can it not happen going forward? Why can it not happen going forward to include the exact cost of doing upgrades? Is that possible? If I may, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So our charge actually comes from the Board of Selectmen and the townspeople. So we're not in, empowered to change our own charge. That's not something that we're able to do. Okay, well, could we go back to the town for a vote to change? I suppose that's possible, yes. I would highly recommend that. I, I think that would be reasonable. Um, I just, you know, the collateral damage when it comes to financial impact from this new school, we know it's not the 28.9, and that's the best case scenario, the waivers and everything. We understand, and it's not currently part of this charge, but we understand there's going to be a cost to the center, there's going to be a cost potentially to Paul. And if we went to a new school, we're going to potentially have a cost, and these are all potentials, but highly likely we're going to have a cost to the roadways when it comes out to getting out to the state roads. I hear from many people that, you know, as it is right now, sometimes those turns are dangerous. So if we're going to throw more traffic on that, probably should be improving that, correct? So, you know, I hear the upgrades would be more than the 18.9 million. And I agree, it probably is. But that being said, 28.9, like I said before, that's going to be higher too. So to say, hey, that's 18.9, not a real number, 28.9 is So during one of the meetings I went to, um, it was a great, great uh, engagement. And uh, one of the things came up with savings, uh, operating costs, expenses that we would be saving. One of the numbers that I heard was 550,000 from Frexco, approximately. So of that 550, 440 is driven from salaries. So I would understand or expect a principal to be let go or probably let go. I'm going to have two principals in one school. Of that 440, not to go into specific details, but are we looking at 200,000? What would that cost be say, uh, that cost savings? I think that Phil has worked out the uh, projected cost savings. Can speak to that. If it were a principal, typically you're between 100,000 and 120, depending on their experience. Okay. Okay. So 440 subtract 140. We have $300,000 more in savings that we're going to have in salary, correct? In, in theory. So when we combine all these kids, are we going to then let go of teachers and increase the student to teacher ratio? Because in theory, all well, that staff would have to come together, you know, to not increase that student ratio. So one of the things that, that I think the Board of Ed has held tight um, is trying to keep the list of who those folks are tight. Hey, the reason why is if, if there is no project, we don't want people running for the hills because they're not going to have a job. Um, I, the one job I've said is mine. Um, it was my, I think, the superintendent's position. Being into one building typically for pre K through eighth grade, you'll see a part time superintendent. Um, there's definitely a conversation that we had around the administration. I think they're aware of that. It doesn't mean that that's what the board had to decide, but there's definitely a conversation about that. Um, and then if there's any overlap across the buildings for uh, educational positions or any staff that, you know, whether it's a paraprofessional or a office staff or um, custodial, the Board of Ed would have to identify those things. We have a, a rough draft, basically, and they haven't even seen it. So it's, it's based upon what we believe we would need, and it's tied to Ed specs for, um, to run a pre-K, one pre-K grade school. 
Understood. So potentially that 440 is hypothetical and may be inflated if the Board of Education did not agree to let go of those teachers. Correct? They could do more or they could do less. Okay, so it's a hypothetical. So to me, I mean, that 440 is it's just exaggerated. Um, I think that number is somewhere, maybe 200,000, I don't know, but I just, that 550,000 overall in, in savings, I think is, is grossly uh, inflated. Um, you know, I'll just end, you know, personally, I'd like to see us save the taxpayers millions uh, and just do the upgrades instead of spending $60 million on a new school uh, total project. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, on the line, yeah. Don Burke. Don Burke. Um, you can mute yourself and offer your comments. Okay, Ralph. Good evening. Don Berg, Red Oak Hill Road, Willington, Connecticut. Um, I just want to start out by saying, uh, as a Zoom participant tonight, uh, the audio is about five over 10. And I would say that probably one third to maybe one half of the conversation is intelligible enough to understand. So that's unfortunate for the committee and for those people trying to participate and learn more about it. Uh, so I will ask that future participants talk even slower and more clearly than they have up till now. Uh, the other thing I will say is that perhaps on the building committee website, there is more than five years of proposed taxes. Is that correct? Um, the, the information that's been on the postcards and published on the website, I think, goes out five or six years from I'll take your word for it. I didn't understand, Ralph. I'm sorry. What you see in the far right column, um, I think all of those tables is the annual increase in property tax bills based on a particular um, assessment. Okay, well, I'm looking at the large card. I don't see a far right column with more than five years, but I will have to look at the website and see if I see more. Uh, and of course, at this point in time, we don't know what infrastructure costs are on the new school. And that's less than ideal, but I understand your constraints. Uh, that's all I have to add other than uh, I hope uh, the town has some money to throw at technology so that these Zoom meetings can be more informative for the public. I would certainly agree with that. Um, I've been on your side of the meeting from this room. It is difficult. And we should spend some money on technology too. Okay. From a technology standpoint, please speak clearly into the microphone, both the audience speakers and both the committee, please. Thank you. We'll do what we can. That's it, no, that you're good, done. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, a member uh, who's present here, uh, that would be Mr. Clark, Matt Clark. Thank you. I'll try and speak um, slowly and clearly. Um, so yeah, I had a couple of points to make. Matt Clark, 42 Berkeley Road. Um, the, um, I attended probably 10 or 15 meetings of the school building committee. I stopped going about probably five or six months ago, maybe once since then. Um, so I want to cover a couple of things, two or three. Um, the first is that the options produced by SBC in my mind are, are wrong for Wellington. They don't really work well. The uh, second thing is the residents should, should go no and ask the SBC to do to go back to the drawing board and, and do a better job trying to meet the needs of the people of Wellington. Um, so uh, the six options produced the six options produced by SBC. Uh, it's very confusing, I think. Um, so you can see it happening in, in the call the Zoom thing. Um, yeah, I've heard, I've heard other people say it's confusing. I tried to figure it out. That card that was sent was full of numbers. Um, so 
the process of building a, a new school, whether there are whether it's at Hall or another site, is supposed to save us money. You would make this this comment before. I'll just reiterate: it's supposed to save us money. It's four or five hundred thousand dollars, but it's completely up to the discretion of the Board of Education. And the um, the costs for underwriting the bonds and paying back the bonds for a, a 30, 20, 30, 40 million dollar project are going to far, far, far away any savings. Um, so I remember when this started, the, 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 the reason was we're going to save money. And um, you know, that, that, somewhere that changed, somewhere, somewhere along the line that became 21st century education. Um, so it's catching 21st century education, but to my mind, you know, buildings don't teach children. Teachers teach children. Um, so the next point I want to make was for the new school on the site option uh, with SBC, um, which SBC thinks is the most least, uh, or excuse me, least expensive option. Uh, taxes are set to increase, I think, I mean, you can tell me they're set to increase 47 or 50 percent in the first five years, which is what was up on the screen earlier. And if you carry that forward to the 20 years, um, it's about 100 percent. And you can enlighten me on that as well. Um, so, uh, you know, and the other point I want to make, and some people would make this as well, is that spending at that level will crowd out other spending. I mean, there's only so much money that people want to be paying taxes. Um, so, the, 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 um, so that, that uh, postcard had six options, I think. And I think that's because the Board of Education and the SBC should have narrowed it down to make it more palatable for people so we can understand it. You have two options for a rebuild or a new. Then you have with auditorium, without auditorium. And then you have with waiver, without waiver. Um, so I would hope that you would, it would have been better to narrow it down so they had a good idea of what we were, what we were looking at. Um, and the reason the, this um, waiver is an issue is because I, I think, or if I'm wrong again, we're building a school that's 20, 30 percent bigger than what state guidelines call for. Um, and we don't know whether or not the state of Connecticut is going to reimburse us for that money or not. Um, so, uh, anyway, all right. Well, uh, the other things that I wanted to say the school building bu uh, budget. The Lusinski property uh, does not include funding for road improvements, which has already been mentioned, and, and waters. I don't quite understand that where the water comes from. Someone's made that point already, one of the other speakers. Um, and lastly, or not lastly, second to lastly, uh, the fees and costs associated with, with entering into the bonds isn't included in the cost of the school. So it's 200,000, 150,000, 200,000, maybe more, I don't know. It's going to come out of our general budget in the year that we launch the bonds. So that'd be, I think, next year or the year after. I'm not quite sure. Um, so uh, residents should go no and ask the SBC to go back to the drawing board and come up with a better idea, a better plan. Um, for some of us, increasing taxes by 45, 50, 60 percent isn't a big issue. Um, it's not, it won't be a problem. Uh, for other Wellington residents, it will be a struggle. Um, I would ask all of us to consider the, how the increase in taxes will impact poor people. We have poor homeowners in Wellington, people who don't earn a lot of money. We have senior residents that are on fixed income. They don't earn a lot of money. Um, so I would ask uh, for us to consider how that will how that'll impact our, our fellow citizens. And um, so yeah, I would urge a vote of no and go back to the drawing board. But you know, my, my suggestion would be that we consider innovative options is our phased approach. No one wants to see, you know, no one wants to say no, everybody wants to say yes. Uh, but is, can we say yes to something that's a little more reasonable, that doesn't have quite as much impact on our, on our tax rates. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify a couple of things. Uh, there are not six options. Um, what there are, 
had two complex floor layouts for the all, all school um, reconfiguration. Um, their concepts, but to, to boil it down to basics, there is an option for a new school, there is an option to reconfigure a hall, each with or without an auditorium, which gives us a total of four options to choose from. So um, I think that we all recognize that, that they were uh, financially challenged, the people who live in our town, and that any increase in taxation is going to be hurtful to some and, and uh, perhaps managed by others. We're clearly aware of that and um, I, I would like and hope uh, that folks can focus on uh, uh, other, other issues and other suggestions that would help this committee make a decision. Uh, I'm not discounting those, those costs, but I think we're all keenly aware of that. And I, if we have no one on, uh, who do we have? Claudia Nunn. Claudia Nunn? Yes, Claudia Nunn, 7 Common Claudia. Road. Um, I've lived in town since about 1983, and I have a number of reasons for wanting to build a new school. But the point I'd like to make is that I think that the site, I just absolutely don't understand the choice of that site on um, Glass Factory and Adamic. It, to me, it seems like there are three major intersections that are totally dangerous. They're very difficult to drive and to, to um, get onto the roads. And um, I'll tell about the roads in a second, but the roads are also windy and narrow in that area. And um, it's I, I, a really beautiful section of Wellington. You know, Wellington has many beautiful sections. This certainly is one of them in terms of its lovely farms and, and houses. But I think that uh, I can't understand how 120 sites have been looked at. I'd like to learn a little bit more about what else is considered or what else might be running to be a site. Because I think this, the idea of having to turn from, if you were coming from say the town green heading on 74 and you're going west and you try to make a left onto Glass Factory Road, um, it, it, you really don't have a line of sight as you come to the hill, you can't see over it. It's a very dangerous spot. That road from that point on is extremely windy. If you were coming on Route 32 from Dunkin' Donuts and you're trying to make a left onto a Damick at the Hillside Hill, Hilltop Restaurant, there too, you're coming across traffic. It's a very bad line of sight. And one of the most dangerous in Wellington probably is where Fisher Hill comes out onto Route 32 and trying to make a, a left turn or a right turn. You know, it's, it's particularly left. It's, it's so dangerous. So I'd like to hear more about what might, you know, is it possible to consider other sites? Are there still any others in the running? And what would make you think that this is such a wonderful site given the traffic um, problems in the area. Thank you. Um, I, let me try and speak to some of those things. With respect to the parcel that we looked at, the uh, Land Assessment Committee, which I was on, uh, was uh, got very connected physically with, uh, I think it was four or five parcels. Um, you have to select parcels that are appropriate for development on uh, the, the train. You know, we have very little level land in Wellington. So uh, finding a site that has the area needed and is reasonably level is, is a challenge. Um, some of those sites were in the extreme corners of the town, which is kind of undesirable uh, with respect to bus routes. Uh, we looked at one in the southeast corner. We looked at one in the northwest corner. Um, the northwest corner is probably uh, comparable to this one, except for the, the, the route that the buses are going to take to get there because they would all go by the truck stops. Um, there, there were 120 some odd sites considered. I would have to say from my perspective as an engineer, 
Most of those were eliminated from, from the desk based solely on GIS information that we had, or they were too small, or they were wetlands. They might have been available vacant lands, um, but they weren't they weren't large enough or uh, appropriate for school. The other challenge with finding a site is to find an owner willing to consider selling. And this is what we found on the last factory school road. Now, as far as the traffic, the intersections, yes, there are concerns there. And if this moves forward, there will be a traffic study done. And if we will determine exactly what improvements are needed to make it safe. Um, just for people's information, we got a report from the fire department with respect to uh, Natomec and River Road. And between uh, November of 2007 and January of 2020, there were six accidents that involved in the fall. Um, Bear with me a second. Six accidents involved in a call, four resulting in transport of minor injuries. At the intersection of West Factory School Road and Tallinn Turnpike, there was one in 2015 and one in 2018. Now, um, yes, traffic, uh, managing uh, traffic flow in intersections is a challenge. And uh, we're not going to um, we're not going to do something that uh, exacerbates that issue. So um, that's about all I can say there. Um, and moving on to uh, the next speaker from in, in the room here is Mary Dimman. After Mary would be from Mr. Pelletier. Uh, In between those two, we'll we'll take a, a zoom call. Good evening, Mary Newman, Seven Wide Road. Uh, first of all, uh, respectfully, respectfully, I know that you quoted that there were just those few accidents that happened at the road, but really the number is that low because there aren't school bus volume going in and out. So it's a little bit um, uh, misrepresenting what we could expect if there is school bus traffic going into that site. Um, I'm one of those people who are retired and have a limited income. And frankly, it's quite scary when I think about how much our taxes will increase. In addition to that, I was reading an article that monthly expenditures for people is $371 extra a month. In these hard times. I don't think this is the time for Willington residents to face an increased mill rate uh, at the level of maybe a Blastonbury or a Tolland. We don't even have trash service. We don't even have a police officer in our town. I mean, I think as much as I would love a new school, and I totally agree that yes, it's good to have, this isn't the time to consider spending all these millions of dollars. Um, it's not the right time. And I've heard of other projects too that have that budget and proposed expenditures. And the uh, increase in prices in building materials has made other budgets just blown out of the water. So that's something to consider as well. I would hate to start a project and then find out it's not something we can complete. Thank you. One, one point I would like to add there is built into these numbers is uh, escalation for the duration of projects as well as um, contingency dollars. And they are not insignificant. So uh, a lot of the, the increases that may occur over time uh, the duration of construction, uh, there are allowances in there. So you're seeing numbers that are rather high that are accompanying, hopefully accommodating that. Now, um, I can move on to Catherine, Catherine online. Catherine. 
Hi there. Can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Today, I wanted to go in person, but as a parent in Willington, I am home with a sick child in Willington. So I will uh, share some comments that I have um, in this format. Catherine Kenyon, 16 Mason Road. Um, I am a parent and have had children in the Wellington Public Schools for the past five years. I've been a resident in town for seven years before that. I would like to speak in support of a new K through eight school. I feel that this would be the best option for our children. Both center school and hall school are incredibly dated and are facing increasing maintenance, staffing, and logistical costs. Additionally, both schools are not in line with current educational standards and not to mention are not uh, basic ADA accommodation compliant. Our children deserve the best related to their education, including uh, facilities. Um, so having said that, a few other comments that I would like to make. I, I want to speak in support of every member of the school building committee who I know have all devoted countless hours in good faith on this committee work. Um, they have also gone, you all have also gone above and beyond in assuring transparent and consistent communication with the townspeople on this project. I've seen it asserted several times that people are unaware of what is going on related to this project. And this is somewhat confusing to me as the level of communication has been comprehensive in various formats, ranging from mailings to well over 50 meetings accessible in person and online, informational sessions, including question and answer times such as this meeting tonight, committee members being available at the transfer station, um, to Superintendent Stevens' countless, countless presentations um, that I have been aware of since my oldest daughter was in kindergarten five years ago. Uh, somebody brought me to my very first PTA meeting where that was the agenda item, um, and that was five years ago. Um, and I, again, just sort of continuing those thoughts, I've been really dismayed at the tone in town lately regarding this topic. I've seen endless threads of misinformation and accusations and incivility on social media. For example, I've seen the assertion made over and over that we are only being given the choice between a new or renovated school. This does not seem accurate to me. The intention of a referendum includes the choice to vote no. We all have the right to vote no if that is what we prefer here. That choice would mean keeping all educational facilities as is with only the necessary maintenance going forward. That no vote is available to every voting member in this town and is the purpose of a democratic referendum. I've also heard many of my fellow neighbors proclaim their love for small, small and close towns and then apparently be surprised and suspect conspiracy when there's overlap in family and property and committee membership. We are a small town made up of close families and neighbors and generational connections. That's one of the things I love most about living here and raising my daughters here. I do not believe that these connections are evidence of wrongdoing or ethical conflicts of interest. And going forward, I would like to see us all treat each other with more respect and an understanding of good faith. And those are my comments. Thank you all very much for holding this session. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to add something here with respect to the reconfiguration, alteration, extension, or whatever you would like to call it for all. Um, this is a lot more comprehensive than simply uh, paint, repainting the walls, putting in new fixtures, um, and the like. What we're looking at, and the cost to clear it out, is a, a total of reconstruction with respect to electrical work, plumbing work, um, technology. This is not a case, uh, to use a euphemism, uh, putting lipstick on the pig. We are building a, a comprehensive 21st century addition to house the lower grades, uh, and we will be doing substantial changes to the interior portions of the original 1922 building along with the 1980 addition, portions of the 1980 additions, which include this room we're in. Um, so there, there's significant changes that will turn this into a 21st century educational environment despite the fact that we have a 100-year-old building and a 40-year-old uh, building. So um, moving on to the next feature, Marissa. 
I was too hard to leave for because I heard this. Thank you. Next, from in the room will be Timothy. Okay. Hi, um, Marisa Pelletier, 227 River Road. Uh, Mike McHugh's opening words, uh, shape our town's future. Uh, that's really the sentiment that I have. Um, I've been very unsure. I've been trying to pay attention to every meeting. And I was open to everything, but as I've been um, paying attention and just really doing some reflection on myself and the community, it really is important to me about what is our vision for our future? What do we, how do we compete with surrounding towns? Um, in every direction, we have a town with similar mill rates, but already have resources like police, full-time fire, trash pickup, and high-rated schools. And I really am worried about making sure that we have um, something to compete with. And if we have, I have strong reservations about increasing the mill rate to the point that we negatively impact our residents and our small businesses. And how are we gonna allow ourselves to compete with surrounding towns? As a working parent, I hear the sentiment that we need to think of our children. I am thinking of our children, but we need to think of our community. We have a lot of working families, struggling families, retirees, residents on fixed incomes. I can't support a new school. I live in a two bedroom house. We, I try very hard to be fiscally responsible, and I think it's important for our town to think fiscally responsible as well. Um, and I also had a question um, regarding dispelling any sort of discussion regarding the conflict of, con conflict of interest. Um, was there an ethics review for the purchase of the Brzezinski property? I think that was brought up in the, like, the November or December meeting. There, there was not. Okay. There is, and there has been no purchase too. Oh, okay. Well, not the purchase. That's true. We, we just have an understanding between the property owner and the, the town. If a project encompassing a new school moves forward, then that property will be available for the town to purchase. Okay. That's our commitment. This, thus far, there is no financial commitment at this point, other okay. than the, the, the price that we have discussed. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Timothy, is it fun? Let, let me, let me in. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Timothy Lesniak, uh, 12 Fenton Bluffs. Um, I, I understand that I, I've kind of come into this a little late. Um, I'm newer in town. My wife and I moved to town about, about a year ago, or a little more than a year ago now. But, um, you know, I understand that the building committee was tasked with buying schools. Uh, and that's what the building committee provided. But as part of this, we also should be looking at the no build option, the do nothing, absolutely nothing, and also the renovation option of both schools as they are built, as they stand today. This provides us with a comprehensive view of what all the options are. But as far as I can see, that wasn't done. I do see that there are potential cost savings and operating costs, but it really doesn't match up with what the overall costs are with, with what we're looking at to combine these two schools. And we really don't have true costs of these plans. As it was said, these costs can increase based on some unknowns, including road infrastructure improvements and, and other potential issues, which would be costly as well. So it seems we're being asked to make a decision without having all the information, with a lot of information missing. Further, and, and I, I understand, you know, these informational handouts were sent to, you know, homeowners and, and people in town and everything that were provided at, at various locations. Um, but it seems they're pretty skewed. Um, based on my reading of this, it's very clear that the committee has already made a decision. Um, there are many more disadvantages to a new school that, than just saying Hall Memorial reverts back to the trust. 
We have traffic added to a new area, road improvements that we need, intersections that will need to be upgraded, uh, the utilities that need to be brought in. There's a lot more work and a lot more disadvantages than what's on this sheet. Likewise, there are more advantages than are what listed on the renovation option. What are the plans for the existing schools that we have? If we go with this new build, we're, we still need to maintain them if we own them. Um, I understand if Paul reverts back to the trust, well, we don't have to maintain that, but we may need to put money into that to, to, uh, because of the deferred payments from my understanding. Or are we just gonna let these buildings deteriorate and go into disrepair? I've heard talk about center school becoming a, a new or expanded town hall. Well, guess what? That's more money that now we're gonna to have to spend that, that is not being looked at in this committee. And understand this is a school building committee, but if we're making decisions based on what the future use of an existing building is, that's gonna be escalating costs to the taxpayers when, when center school reverts to say a new town hall or whatever may come up. As I said, my wife and I just moved to town a little over a year ago. Um, have a newborn at home that's going to be in the school system in five years. And I'm very concerned with seeing these two options that we are going to be putting that five year old in the same school, the same building that we have 13 and 14 year olds in. My five year old child walking down the hall and a couple of 14 year old kids getting into a fight. We know it happens. When I was in middle school, it seemed like there was a fight every other week. I'm very worried about those kindergartners getting trampled by the eighth graders when they're passing in the halls, they're getting on buses, they're riding the buses. Right now we have some separation that we will no longer have. For the safety of our children, we need to renovate both the schools as they stand today. This will allow the separation of those children with very different ages and maturity levels. This will continue to use both buildings. We won't lose all. You know, I'd really like to see the cost of just the base renovations of these buildings, not an expansion, not taking down walls and, or taking down wings of the building and building new, just take these buildings, renovate them into the 21st century. And what are those costs? Because frankly, as taxpayers, that's how we make our decision that is it really cheaper to build a brand new building like Glass Factory, or should we be looking at a complete renovation of the two schools that we have right now, bringing them into the 21st century. That's what we need to make an educated decision. Thank you very much. I do. That's a tough one. Um, what we're being told by our own project manager, um, a lot of it is focused on state reimbursement for the cost of school construction. And one of the pluses of a combined if we pay to aid is that we stand in uh, a more willingness on the part of the state to help us support this. Uh, to get, and Bill could probably speak to this with respect to a, a, a renovation of two schools, each one, I don't know that we're going to get any money out of the state of Connecticut to do that. Bill, would you speak to that? Sure. So this is uh, in the full um, presentation that we did. Um, this is a list of basically uh, items and it's, it's hard to read. You can see it in the full report. In the Friar report study that was uh, initially done in 2017, they identified a list of all of the projects that need to occur in both buildings. And when you add up all of the projects between the two buildings, there's minimal dollars that you get reimbursement for from the state. You get reimbursement on roofing projects, but you don't get reimbursement on a lot of other things. So we just put in $100,000 worth of unit ventilators. You don't get reimbursed on that. If you were gonna do that as part of a school building project, you would. So when you look at this, this one I believe is, is the whole school one. It's inflated to $2025 to match our pricing. This one after the local share here, after anything that would be reimbursable is 10 million. And when you do the center school one, it's 6 million. When you add the additional capital improvement projects not on those lists, and these lists are not necessarily complete, there's probably things that we need to add to this. You're at $19 million local share. So it's important to understand that 
that no vote, and I've said this publicly over and over and over, is that I think the Board of Education would have a responsibility to bring all of these projects forward for to, to fix the two buildings. Um, that's that's just where it's at. But there's minimal reimbursement uh, from the state on projects. And, and the silly one I always share is the window project. If you're, we have single pane windows in the upper wing center school. If you are going to apply for state reimbursement, you get minimal percentage. They'll reimburse you on, uh, you know, this is it on the the actual window, but not the construction, or vice versa. Uh, vice versa, I think it's vice versa, right? Um, so there's there's quirky things like that in the state rules for reimbursement, and there's a lot of projects that just simply do not qualify for any. You know, if you don't mind, Bill. No. <laughs> so. I want to just add a little bit to that just by way of getting information out there. Um, I know I'm new here, so I'm completely aware of that position, but um, I hope I can at least you know, represent my industry um, experience to share a little bit of, I guess, words of caution. Um, those numbers up there are aged at this point, and I know we've escalated those numbers to $20,000, $25,000. But there has been six years since that assessment has, under, has been undertaken. And in those six years, there is likely changes to the scope of work. Not less, because I know we haven't taken care of a lot of those items they are still sitting out there. Um, there is likely increase or changes to the scope of work outlined in the prior study. The other, there's also, it, it's a pretty critical point too, as well. The, it doesn't show it on this slide, but the prior study when they made these assumptions, they assumed all of this work was going to be done as a single project. That's what's captured in these values. These are not summer slammer. This is not a summer slammer scope of work. This is not getting done in a single summer. This is a very complex set of renovations. Ventilation, for example, throughout the school is going to be impactful throughout the building. Um, there will be cost in trying to phase that or split that work up uh, beyond what was represented here. You break big projects up into smaller pieces, they are going to have added costs, significant added costs. Um, if you delay projects out over a 10-year period of time, there is going to be significantly more escalation on some of the larger projects. These are all just factors to be aware of. So this $19 million number is a big number. Um, but there is likely more to the story that is not quite represented fully in the prior study. Um, the other thing to note is in a comparison between these projects and both these new school options, um, these are really critical repairs. These are infrastructure repairs, these are ADA improvements, these are building envelope repairs. These are not 21st century improvements. Yes, you'll get new ceilings when you put ventilation in a building, but you are not reconfiguring space, you are not there's no FF&E um, or technological upgrades included in many of these numbers. Um, it's just the comparisons are different. So I do think this uh, committee needs to, however we can, I know it's not our charge, but I think it's an important factor to, to take a look at um, and at least try to portray that information because I, I haven't heard it. Um, and, you know, I just want to be sure that people are comparing uh, or understanding apples to apples or apples to oranges, but like air, but um, just understanding the differences between these numbers and the new project projects, et cetera. So, I'll share. Yeah. Yeah. Like, can I just share one piece of information to the Go ahead. So in the Friar report, again, these are 2017 numbers. We did not move them forward. There was an option to uh, renovate two new, both schools. And that cost was about $7 million total project, more than one pre-K through eight on this site. And to the town share, again, at that time, um, it was about a $4 million uh, increase. So overall, uh, in 2017, those numbers were more, and that helped lead the Board of Education to recommend to the town um, a pre-K through eight school. Thank you. Uh, realistically, too, uh, would you, and I don't know if um, Mr. Marshall covered this, but when you talk about renovating center, 
where are the students going to be when we do that? Uh, that incurs a cost. If we just do a total renovate to new of all, where are we going to put the students? If we do this only during the summer, which for some of the renovations, um, it may not be that simple just to do it in the summer months. And it may require moving students out. Where are we going to put them? That all incurs a cost. So while in many respects, the renovation numbers look better, um, and the reality is there are going to be other costs with respect to how we continue to educate our students. So that, that's part of what we're wrestling with as well. And uh, quite frankly, our, our charge was boiled down to a new school and a new site and a um, reconfiguration, alteration, extension, and, and serious up, updating of this school here. So uh, please keep that in mind. Uh, next speaker, uh, we have the one online, the one online, uh, Nancy Perretti. Thank you. After Nancy would be Thomas Perretti. Nancy from Atlantic Furniture, Lillian Hill Road. Um, I appreciate all the efforts you put into these projects and um, options uh, presented to us. I know that's your charge is to present the options. Uh, my concern about this project, of course, is the impact on citizens and our community who will adversely be affected by what will be a huge increase in their taxes. Um, Lillian population for the census is 5,586 people. Out of that, 13.7% of the population is below poverty level. Just some facts that you should be aware of that citizens might not concerned when they're making this decision. Um, their ages, 0 to 19 to 19%, 20 to 59%, uh, 20 to 59 age or 58%, and 60 to over 80, is 24% of our population. The median age is 33.8. Per capita income is 37,640. Okay, that's not low. The median household income, 78,351. Again, that's not a lot of income to support an extra increase in our taxes. 32% of the population has an income of under $50,000. 32% of, of our population has an income of $50,000 to $100,000. There's only 30% earning over $100,000. And 5% of our population earns over $20,000 or $200,000. This is per the census. You can look it up, it's right on the <laughs> Okay, I've lived in Wellington all my life, and for years of scrimping and saving, we have a nice home. Income is not considered when we pay our taxes, only the property of own. It must take us years to accumulate that money. I don't have $142,000 income. The increases in our taxes for these people below poverty level, those retired with fixed income, those below the fifty thousand dollar income, or even at the median income of seventy eight thousand, will likely not be able to afford an increase of maybe two hundred up to two thousand dollars per debt every year at the end. If this project goes through without other revenue to offset it, you will see older generations forced to sell their homes to go back to work in their 60s and 80s, single parent families struggling, and where will the seniors and elders go when they can't afford to live in Wellington any longer? There's not enough senior housing, there's no low income housing. New families aren't going to come to Wellington when our no rate is increased. No matter how nice our schools are, 
We are going to price people right out of our community. Children who live in lower income homes don't do well in school, no matter how good the schools are. Only about 32% of people under $50,000 income will qualify for any help or assistance. We can't buy for them young on a hot dog budget. When I shop, I buy what I can afford. I buy all the new shiny things that I see in the stores, but based on the census reports for population and income, this community is not in position to afford an extravagant budget of 60 to $69 million. An administration that refused to apply for HUD grant money for homeowners for years now expect these families to put this project in the form of huge increases in taxes. Jay Money. Thank you. That was Hi there, my name is Thomas Pippen. I live on 46 Grove Hill Road. I am a lifelong resident of this town. Um, I graduated from Hall Memorial School in 2018. I also went to Center Elementary School. Okay, anyway, so um, while my time in Hall Memorial School, I saw a lot of, you know, problems that needed to be solved. And unfortunately, those problems were very expensive. And the more we continue to hold off, you know, doing any kind of increase in terms of like um, renovating the school, we're going to continue to have these problems and these um, the dollars increase. So I am for renovating this school rather than building a new school. Um, just because I think it would be better to not have two buildings that we don't know the full future of after we uh, don't use the first one. So that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, Donna Clark, you're next. Donna Cook, 77 Common Road, and I'm speaking as a member of the community. Um, one is I really believe that whatever needs to happen to have an overall plan for the town is probably most appropriate because we need to know if we go to a new building, new site, what will happen to the other buildings, or if we decide to renovate the hall, what would happen to center school. As some of the previous speakers mentioned, um, you're looking at 80, 800,000 to a million dollars a year just to fix, maintain our roads that are currently in um, use. And according to the November 22nd, 2022 Emergency Services Efficiency Committee, the fire department is looking to add whatever bonds they need for what they need onto the school building bond. Um, my understanding is the bond for the new building would be a 20 year bond, is that correct? Have we determined yet what the length of the life of the building would be? Because I was quite disappointed to learn that the fire department buildings were rather short in life for something like a fire department. I mean, I think it was like 20 years or 40 years, but you know you're going to need a fire department in perpetuity. So do we know the length of the life of the building that's being proposed with these costs? Uh, Mr. Marshall might be able to uh, comment on that. Uh, typical design life for a new school today? Um, yeah, I mean, there are a number of factors in design, but um, typically as you go into any of these new school construction projects, you are projecting out uh, towards a 50 year lifespan um, or beyond. I mean, the state likes to understand that they're committing dollars to a project that is not um, expendable wherever possible. At least that has been my experience. Um, that being said, I'm not saying every building product, you know, in the building is going to last 50 years. There are maintenance, you know, it, it's, you know, you're gonna need a roof after time. Um, but these are intended to be community buildings that last. So 
The other thing is currently both of our schools have public water. And I know it's a guess your best on the new property, whether or not it would have enough water pressure um, in order to support the building. I think that in part, whatever is done, the cost of the water hookup should be included, um, not only for the safety of the children, but as a more realistic cost instead of being surprised by the cost of the water hookup. Um, the other uh, excuse me. Uh, I, I just want to touch on that topic. Um, the, the committee's a bit challenged with respect to adequate potable, potable water, uh, number one, because we have not made a decision on whether to move forward with the new school. We uh, have limited funding for site investigation. Uh, I understand from our chairman that, that uh, Test wells have been installed on that property. Uh, and I suspect the purpose of that has to do with groundwater levels and any possible groundwater contamination. Now, uh, as far as a portable water source, we're either going to do it via wells or, God forbid, we should have to run the water line from Tallinn to that school. Or wherever it comes from. <laughs> but, but That's should, where our water comes from. But there should be included in the cost of the new school, new site, at, at least an estimate of getting public water to that site. It may, it may be a fuzzy estimate, but it shouldn't be ex excluded. Would, would, uh, these estimates do include uh, septic, of course. Uh, and it does anticipate wells. What we are, you know, this is why we build in contingencies into any construction estimate, is we don't know whether it's going to be two wells or whether it's going to have to be three in order to get the yield that we need. Um, so that, that's, those are costs that can be uh, reimbursed somewhat by the state of Connecticut. We don't want to incur those costs now because it comes out of each and every one of us. It comes out of our pocket. So just, just a little clarification on that. And then if you could go to the slide that was sent out to everybody that shows the cost per year, I think like hundred first year was like hundred and four. Okay. Um, I appreciate the information, but I believe at a glance it is misleading. So somebody who owns a hundred thousand dollar house pays about $3,100 in taxes currently. So in the year, the first year, it would be the 31 plus the 104. The next year, and it, it's accumulative. So we actually do the math. By the end of those years, the person who owns the $100,000 house, their taxes have doubled. And I don't think that that's really clear when you look at this. Um, and it seems like it would go down because in 27, 28, it's $68 versus the 347. Um, I'm not quite sure why the new school versus the alteration. It seems like there's a big bump in 27, 28 on the new school. Um, sorry, on the old school alteration versus the new school, which is the prior year. But um, I think going forward, whatever information is provided, people should know what their tax is going to be at the end of the year, not just that little incremental because it is cumulative. Thank you very much and thank you for all your time. Thank you. Um, just to touch on that for a moment, um, the first three or four years, really you can nod your head or shake your head, depending on whether or not you agree with me, is construction loan. Those are notes, notes, and they increase over the first three years because of the magnitude of construction. That's correct. And at the end of construction, then we float a bond to pay off the construction loans, which is why there's such a dramatic bump at year four or year five, depending on which option you're looking at. Just to explain how those numbers work. Um, the bottom line is, yes, they cost a lot of money. And that I won't dispute. Um, anyone, no one online at this point, so.
That's what's added to the current year, yes. That's Okay. And we've been through this in meetings. There, there's, when, when you're talking about taxes on real estate, there's three numbers that are pertinent to any homeowner. There is what the town sees its value as, and there is what you're assessed at, which is 70% of the assessor's perspective of what your house is worth. And the one number that most homeowners care about is what can I sell it for? And that sale price is not part of this. It is what the town is looking at for an assessment. So just well, can I clarify that? Sure, go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure that can I answer your question? I know you guys are talking. Um, it's not the additional every year. So if you, the example that was just given, if it was $3,000 of your taxes, in 23-24, it would be 3,104. Then you take the 3,104 the next year, you would add 163 to that. So it's not that you take both of them each time and, and add it, it's just each year, that's the amount it increases. So this person's taxes by the end are probably going up I was going to say a thousand dollars too. Thanks for saying that. About a thousand dollars for a property that has the assessment of a hundred thousand. That makes sense. I hope it's just. I, I I also feel that the tables should have been a little bit clearer. Yes, it's nice to talk about the incremental increases, but the reality is, what did you? What are you paying this year? What will you pay next year? What will you pay the year after that? But it needs to be clear. Um, anyway, um, moving on is Linda Miner here. Uh, she's next. After Linda would be uh, Lisa Eaton, unless someone puts their hand up online. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I noticed when I walked in and I was looking over the tables is the tax information isn't even over there. And when I looked at this, Initially, I got something in an email. I did eventually get my own snail mail. I didn't know it was cumulative. I picked up on that on social media. I, I, I don't think people are going to know that, except for the people in this room and a handful of people on social media that asked that question. It, it's not here. This, this needs to go out again. Maybe add that up so that people know what's going on. That it, it's not clear. Um, so the SBC and its charge were established by the Board of Selectmen, which is heavy on the side that wants new buildings in this town. Even so, I want to commend the committee and their time, their heartfelt efforts, their dedication and to their charge and what lies ahead for them. The committee uh, defined the pre-K through eight school in cooperation with the Board of Ed was also heavy on the side of wanting a new school. That's where we're at. But it's up to us voters. We can decide in the end in March to vote no. According to the slides that we were going through, um, all the work outside of the property line is not eligible for reimbursement. This includes costs to bring phase three electrical to the property, costs to renovate such a school building to repurpose it or demolish it, Cost for traffic study, widening roads, installing traffic lights, sidewalks. Um, Paul and Center School, when they add up the cost for updating these buildings, which is in the, the cost avoidance summary, almost $19 million, um, they don't mention that much of these costs were caused by abuse and neglect. How can we entrust $60, $70 million in building? The roofs were cut up by the snow removal from the snow throwers, and the cost of the new roofs, according to the slide, is over $2 million. The brick exterior that needs repointing, you can flip that aside if you want. The only brick that needs repointing is from water damage in instances such as a downspout that's missing. 
this, or there's no gutter to direct the water away from the building. There goes another $600,000. The photo on the slide shows like a close up of the damage to the brick. But if you step back and look at it, you see the downspout is missing. It's a deceptive slide that was presented months ago, damage from years of neglect, and still they haven't replaced the simple downspout. The parking lot is fine. We all parked here tonight. The slide says we need a full parking lot replacement, and that's just not so. Replacement windows, as they said, we've needed them since the Friar 2017 report, and they haven't even bothered to clock them. That's neglect. You're, you're wasting energy, loss of energy there. How can we entrust a new ed spec building when we treat it any better? I, I, I believe we cannot. The Willington Project Budget Summary presents a new school as a lower cost option than alterations to hall. But because they can only focus on their specific needs, the other costs to the town are not considered by the SBC. They, they are focused on only their specific needs of a school, which is important, but should not be seen with, with such tunnel vision. Costs to residents on fixed incomes are apt to lose their homes, but that's not the charge of the SBC. That's not the concern. Let them move. Go ahead, raise our taxes, keep the riffraff out, build all your new buildings, out with old buildings, out with old people, change Wellington forever. You have the votes, you can do whatever you want, just go for it. I, on, on a positive note, though, I would like to commend Mr. Stevens for, I heard you attended the Center School plumbing with on Christmas. That was very admirable. Thank you very much on that. Um, there's, there's plenty of want for a new school, but if we borrow 40 to $50 million by selling, by selling bonds, this will severely limit us being able to borrow for any other town expenditures. How does the ed specs define reasonable costs, or does it? There was no definition in the end, but as far as cost, that's what we're doing as a committee is trying to determine what the cost is. And before that, uh, actually defining what a pre-K through eight school would consist of and um, applying current construction costs to the square footage involved in, in uh, such a building, such a facility, whether it be new or whether it be uh, a, a reconfiguration of what we currently have. So it doesn't care about cost, it cares about education facility, but not the cost. We're doing what we were judged to do. I understand, okay, I'm just pointing that out. I, I think that was a rhetorical statement, kind of on your Indeed. point. Yeah. Um, I just heard a mention of two to three barrels to be put in, and this is gonna, going to lower the water table for residents. Wells could run out of water, they could need to drill deeper. Um, this is considered an R80 residential, correct? And when is the vote or the process for that? I mean, I recall what we went through for the warehouse. What's the information on the R80? I'm oh, sorry, did you repeat that one? Go ahead, go ahead. That's it. There would be a separate process this is approved by the board as a move forward by the board of selectmen, et cetera, et cetera. The, the referendum passes that would go before the planning zone commission here. At some point, that would be scheduled and uh, public meeting similar to the one that you mentioned. Planning and zoning in the near future. Uh, after the referendum, after if, if and when the townspeople approve the funding for it, yes. Did they, did they select the referendum date yet? I don't believe we I don't believe Wait, we select the one Go ahead. Eric has worked very carefully with the schedule. So this committee has outlined um, a time frame, but a, a referendum has not been called. And a referendum has not been called because no project has been referred from the school building committee to the board of selectmen. Um, at that time, then a uh, process will begin that would um, choose a date for referendum. Okay, thank you. Uh, and this point, right? there would be no reason to go before planning and zoning until there actually is a project to be considered. Okay, for the RV. 
Um, something else I noted was they talk about the replacement of the handicap ramp and at the exterior of all still needs to be replaced. But what it doesn't say is that all of the rails in that post, it sits in like a small pool or a cup of water, which freezes and expands and that damages the rust and cracks. So that wasn't, it isn't something that's being maintained, but just like poor maintenance and things that are causing us to need all these other extra expenses. Okay, but well, I think we're getting a little bit off on tangents. I think Phil can speak to the fact that those railings have, in fact, been repaired. Is that correct? That ramp is on the CIP list. Oh, it is. I thought you did some replacement. Something. We just did some repairs to the, the broken concrete. Okay. Um, that was in the bedroom. When the plans talk about maximizing natural light and sustainability. Um, I looked at the windows at Center School when we were in the gym for the slideshow, and the light is blocked by pull down shades. I don't know how much you really need tons of light. I mean, obviously, you want windows, kids need windows. There's no windows in this gym, but that's okay. Uh, how much do we really need tons of light when the windows are if they're going to get blocked by shades? And any window will never be as insulating as a wall. Some windows, of course, are necessary, but too many weeks going to let in cold air in the winter, and in the summer it's going to be too hot. So not, I don't think that's a, a good plan. You pretty much sum things up. I hope. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Moving on. Uh, we. We got one online. Very good. Steph Summers, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Steph Summers at, from Four Y Road. Uh, I serve on the board of finance, but I'm here to speak as just one citizen with a strong interest in equipping the 21st century learners in town with the best education we can offer. Um, my son, born in 2000, is a product of the local schools, but whether I have a kid in school or not, I view our mission as a social contract in a free society to educate our youngest citizens and give them the best shot we can give them. Now, for the first time since I came here 26 years ago, I feel energy in the air for actively facing our crumbling and outdated schools. We have a group of committed citizens with a variety of skills delving into the weeds of splicing two schools, one 100 years old and one 70 years old, into a K through eight to harvest some ongoing savings while we also update the educational environment. I was on the school board several years ago, uh, Erica mentioned, when we reviewed in depth an in-depth study on multiple school options for Wellington. After a lot of study and deliberation, the board voted unanimously to recommend a new K-8 school for Wellington, and I support that now. I want to see a new K-8 school with a cheery, light-filled, flexible environment where kids can thrive all day and where our teachers, yes, always the number one resource in the schools, are inspired to enliven content and create new avenues into knowledge for everyone. I wanna see science classes with updated technology and outdoor learning opportunities. I wanna see playing fields that can accommodate boys and girls teams equally, thank you Title IX, on a site with room for growth. I wanna see a cafeteria with natural light, and school events and town meetings with good acoustics and sight lines, and where seating isn't limited to aging bleachers. Of course, a new school will cost us more than we've been paying, but we have had the lowest mill rate in the region for years and years. A new school is much cheaper, quicker to complete, and easier on the kids and staff than the hall option, which by the way, has about half the acreage the state recommends for a K through eight of this size. And I worry that going into the walls of Hall in a complex demolition and renovation may uncover unforeseen costs and environmental woe. The third option, doing nothing, relying on duct tape and repairing old structures is not an option to me. 
every now and then a person is hit with an abnormally large utility increase or personal demands that squeeze their budget. This is different. This time we're being asked willingly to face an increase that over 20 years will build slowly, peak, and then taper off. It's more than what we're used to, but it's something we can plan for, an investment in the future beyond the status quo. As state taxpayers, we've contributed to new school builds in Tallinn, Stafford, Mansfield, all over and elsewhere, enhancements that have juiced up those communities. A new school is our cheapest option with the highest share paid by the state that we can get and best promise for the future. It's Willington's turn. Let's put the duct tape down and go toward the light. Thank you. Lisa. Um, good evening. My name is Lisa Eaton and I live at 38 Timber Lane. And the first thing I want to say is thank you to all of you because um, I know that this has taken hundreds of hours and in some cases thousands of hours of commitment to put into this committee. And I've spent a lot of time, I've watched almost all the videos I've read all the minutes, I've read all the materials that you have provided. And although I might not have agreed with everything everyone has said, there's no question that in order to be on a committee like this, you have to love the town. And so I have the utmost respect for that. And so thank you. Um, I have a concern and a comment. Um, my concern is that I, I do attend the meetings and I, I'm either live on the during your SBC meetings or I watch them afterwards, and the SBC meetings are not well attended. And if you look at the number of views for the SBC meetings after the fact, they're fairly low. So I do question where people are getting their information. And I do want to push back against the narrative. I think that you as a committee get a lot of criticism for not sending information out, not providing everything. And it, it's just not that is just not factually accurate. People need to be actively engaged. This is one of the biggest decisions that our town will make in our lifetimes. And this is a decision that will affect us for the next 100 years or so. Um, in keeping with the, my impression of the purpose of the meeting tonight, I want to speak out in favor of um, selecting the new school over the renovation. To me, it's, uh, it's clearly a, a less expensive option. And um, when I look at all the materials, there's one thing in particular that stands out to me in making that decision, and that is listening to the experts on this. We have spent thousands of dollars getting expert opinion on this. And when I listen in particular to the architect discuss um, the conceptual plans for the new school versus the alteration extension, I hear that architect saying things like, this would be challenging. This is, um, they're not exactly sure how this would work. There's more challenges and limitations to the renovation alteration, sorry, than there are in the new school build. And so I know that on the national level and our national politics, there's this like anti-expert bias um, that trickles down to our local politics as well. And we're certainly not going to solve that problem tonight, but there are times when you can kind of ignore this anti-expert bias, and there's times when it's really important, and it's really important when you make a $60 million decision. So when you uh, meet on February 1st to make the decision, I just ask that you really keep um, what weighs the most is, is what we've heard from our experts who we hired. Thank you. Thank you. Alan Ayers, uh, followed by Deputy Hussain. Uh, hi, Alan Ayers, 38 Timber Lane, um, been a resident for about 10 years. Um, my understanding is we're come here to tell you, you know, which option we'd like to choose so you guys have that information going forward on February 1st. Over the 53 YouTube videos, a lot of these questions people are asking have already been answered multiple times. Um, so I'm just going to start. Um, I'm in favor of a new school and some of the reasons why I support that. Um, I was a union basin for 12 to 15 years. 
worked for big companies like Dexter, Connecticut Mason, worked on multiple, multiple school projects. I never worked on a restoration project that went smoothly at all. Nothing works like you think it's going to work. You know, bricks in 1920 and bricks now are different. It's just stuff doesn't line up. It's not going to work like everyone thinks. It's very difficult. There's a lot of challenges. Also, in that process, you're looking at trailers, materials. A lot of space is going to be used up on this on this site if they're going to do that. My kids just got through the COVID years. Um, my son's going to be moving on. My daughter's going to be moving to going to be moving to all school. Um, I would hate to see her go from going through COVID, getting like a year and a half, two years of regular school, and then going back to this construction phase. And that's a double whammy for her. Uh, that's going to be awful. Um, also, for you know, for teachers, you know, everyone's worried about the test scores. We have to fix the test scores. Well, getting, you know, keep keeping the teachers we have that are these great teachers. You know, we got to give them something. You know, we have other towns that have new systems, you know, new schools, that's going to be attractive. It's going to be attractive to our, our teachers that we have now. It's going to be attractive to the next generation of teachers. Um, and there's other simple things that's just like sports. We're talking about the sports fields. Um, I know a lot of people here, because we're in here right now, might not even notice this at all, but, you know, as a watch my son play basketball here, I noticed he, we're the only core in that all the teams we play that has flattened out three-point line for a high school three-point line because our court is that small. I mean, unless you play basketball, you understand that this is just unreasonable that we can't even have like a full-size uh, basketball court for you know, our junior high teams and stuff like that. And I know, you know, some people might overlook sports, but that's how I know a lot of the people on this board is through sports, through our kids doing stuff like that. You know, having overlapping fields here at all, I mean, it's, it's already scary enough having like pillars like a foot away from you know, the out of bounds. I'm always afraid my son's gonna get shoved playing soccer to one of these pillars or, you know, our, our fields are pretty rough. You know, it would be really great to see like the new school and give them, you know, an opportunity. And I know some parents um, that were, you know, went through the system with my son that they had left this system to go to another town because of, you know, different sport opportunities and offers and things like that. So it does impact. Um, one of the other big things I'm concerned about is technology. Um, doing a new school is going to allow you a lot of opportunities to set up the technology, not just for today, but for years in the future. You know, if we do this here, renovate here, and then, you know, in 20 years, we're trying to get some sort of Wi-Fi, all these challenges of having an existing building, um, you know, what are we going to be using? We don't even know, I'm sure what we're going to be using for Wi-Fi, but having a new school, leaving it open for opportunities is a huge advantage. Um, you know, and I, I do understand that it's going to be like really hard for a lot of people financially. And um, I understand that we're a small town. And I don't think it's impossible to remain a small town and have nice things. Um, there's a lot of towns out there. They're not huge towns. We're not, you know, bringing McDonald's, but we can still, you know, we can still have the best of things. Um, you know, we're so close to UConn. UConn's expanding rapidly. Like we should be getting, you know, when people are buying houses here, these professors and things like that should be wanting to come here. They want to come here because we have a new school, we have good teachers, we have good marks, we have um, athletic, you know, opportunities for those children. Um, if if we don't, we're just going to keep getting narrower and narrower. We're going to keep losing residents. Um, and I know, I, I really feel bad. Like people have mixed incomes and they and they can't manage. But at the same time, there's other people here. If we don't build a new school or we don't you know, do the hall school option or any of these options, we just repair, some other people are gonna leave too. Some people on the, on the higher end might leave. Um, and that's not gonna help those seniors either, because then they're gonna have to end up picking up a bigger end of the burden on whatever we decide to do. So I just wanted to let you know that um, I ran a new school and I hope that's what you guys go on February 1st. Thank you. Yeah. I've heard of the mind. Uh, we'll take the person on the line first. Who do we have? Hi, uh, Melissa McKinnon, uh, 63 Lushan Road. Hey. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I have lived in town for 17 years. 
and have three children, two currently in Willington schools and one at EO Smith High School. My former husband, who was 45 years old, also lived in Willington his whole life and attended both Center and Hall School. My ex-father-in-law and his, his father, who was 89 years old, also attended the Willington schools. So it just goes to show how old, obviously, the schools are. Our children deserve a new pre-K through eight 21st century learning school that is comparable to our neighboring towns, Stafford, Tolland, Mansfield, who all have new schools. If we want to attract new families to buy houses in town, one of the main things that they are going to be looking at is our school system. I understand that if a new school is built, the tax increases will be a difficult burden to some families, but I believe it's time to put our children first. It's time to invest in our schools and our children. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, thank you so much for your hard work. I know this is not an easy task. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Zafir Hussein, 48 Myrtle Road. Uh, I speak on behalf of myself and my family, a member of the public. My statement is no way of being affiliated with any businesses, boards, or matters of this nature. I want to thank you guys so much for all your hard work. It's not easy to put together a presentation of this magnitude and then also to uh, spend as much time hearing the proposal and the console. Thank you very much. I unfortunately will have to continue the pros and cons, so please bear with me. Um, my history in Wellington is that I've been here for seven years. Uh, I think I represent the family that you guys are preaching to. I have three kids under the age of four. So this school, this renovated school, this school is speaking to me. So I'm taking it from that perspective. I want to echo what somebody else said, which is what is the town, what is the vision of this town? We need to really have a comprehensive plan, not just of the school, but where we plan on taking our town in the future. This is one of the steps. This school is one of those steps. I think this burden that the committee has presented is too much to bear for the citizens of Wellington. The approved budget of the 2021-2022, our small town had an annual budget of 8.5 million. 8.9 million, nearly 50% of this budget is allocated to K through 8 education. And yet you have plenty of schools to grade to the point we're now trapped in a no-win scenario. Either we succumb to the outrageous request of a new school, or we have a monumental overall needed for our current schools. It is not our fault that this situation is what it is. We have ponied up the money, however, it appears that neither proper maintenance nor foresight from leadership was implemented early on to prevent the situation you presented to us today. If the information you presented to us is true in our situation, then this committee needs to concede to the citizens of this town, because this project simply cannot cost this much, period. The project you're proposing is three to four times our annual budget. There's no way that people on a fixed income can handle this financial burden that you're projecting. The mailer that you sent out was more difficult to understand than astrophysics. Now I know that the values of the mailer is not is now cumulative, so I apologize because my values that I uh, calculated were based on today's date plus whatever, plus whatever, uh, that the base, came from not the previous year, but from this year. So from that, I calculated the mill rate of the mailer, which is the most important information that's missing, is the mill rate. Uh, our mail rate is currently 31.27, which is 92nd out of 169 towns in the state of Connecticut, which puts us right dead in, slack, right dead in the middle of 54 percentile in the state. By implementing the options presented, our mail rate would increase to, which is wrong, 35 to 39. This does not seem like a lot. However, that number would put us in the 79th to 92nd percentile of the state, now higher. Simply put, 46 to 14 to 36 towns relatively will have a mill rate higher than our town. So, what type of person will be willing to move out to Wellington, a town that has no grocery store, bank, hospital, downtown attraction, when the mill rate is this high? The answer is single income, dual income family with no kids. So what type of demographic are we attracting? Then why, why have a school at all? If this is the type of demographic we are attracting, then why have a school at all? This is a rhetorical question, as in town, as every town in CT has an elementary school. But this is a serious question I pose to the committee. So I repeat, what type of person would we be willing, would be willing to move out 
to Wellington, a town that has no grocery store, bank, hospital, downtown attraction, when the mill rate is that high. Back to the project as it stands today, you have made a concession to alleviate the financial burden. You have to make a concession to alleviate the financial burden of this town. You have to find ways to cut the cost of the project. I recognize that change is difficult, but we all need to undertake this difficulty together. We do need to move forward into the 21st century, and change is hard. With that said, I'd like to propose three solutions for the committee to, pretend, to, to consider. The first one is to bring down the project timeline from renovating, from renovating Hall School. It's my understanding from the presentations you guys presented that we'll be renovating the Walking Turn School. So for the next two years, we'll keep the students, about 120 students, into town-owned public facilities, such as the library and the old town hall, for recreation use of town hall fields. This will shorten the project timeline, thus decreasing costs on construction time and labor. The second suggestion I'd like you to consider is whether proposed land for the new school, change zone into commercial and develop it, bring businesses in to offset our taxes, bring in a hospital, grocery store, community space for all of the students, not just those that are senior and other attractions of this nature. This will draw that type of demographic that will embrace the school we're trying to build for this town. The third one is change of regulations so we have any, so we can have non-blood related occupants with, within our ADUs, except for accessory development units, also known as MIMOS units. These tenants would, would provide an additional source of income to offset future financial burdens of the school and whatever economic disasters we need to see in the future. I know that these are some of the suggestions I made is not the charge of the committee, but I do want to bring them forward. So unless we're able to cut the cost, I truly don't believe that this is a project that we can go forward with. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on one of the suggestions that you made. Um, bring down the time and relocate the kids. Yeah. Uh, that is something that we discussed probably early on in our meetings. Um, is there an option for us to relocate the kids from the swing space? We did look at that. Yeah. Um, problem among many problems is the cost. But the other thing is when you relocate these kids to the idea of bringing them into the library, you now have to renovate, you have to do some renovations to the library, get the technology in there, get the desk set up, get whatever you need to support those kids' education. Same with uh, if you went to the town hall, trying to put the kids in the town hall, you still have to make some renovations and those costs would be our cost to bear as well as it. So I, I just wanted to point that out that we did look at that. So thank yeah, you thank you for clarifying that. But that's changing those public owned buildings is also benefit for the townsmen as well. The townsmen feel as well because now we can move up to brought to date these buildings to now support the type of learning in the future. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, we did we did look at those areas too, and there's just simply not enough space. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sam? Yeah. Welcome. Uh, your name and address, please. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, um, so my name is Samantha Sperry. I live on 73 Lushan Road. And um, I have a couple comments that I want to make. Let me just pull up, I have it a list on my phone. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention was a comment that keeps being made is that we are looking at how much reimbursement we're potentially going to get from the state versus how much we're spending. And I don't think that that's something that's fiscally very wise to do. It's not, it's like, okay, I'm going to go out and buy an $80,000 car because I'm getting this much back instead of looking at, well, you're spending more to potentially save some. Um, so I don't think that that's something that is a valid point looking at it from a financial point of view. Um, I also understand what, I liked a lot of what the last guy had to say and I can also understand being in the construction industry, what the, um, 
gentleman had to say about being a former Mason, I'm also in the construction industry and with any project, even a new project, the engineers, they're gonna miss something. There's gonna be RFIs, which is request for information, which usually turns into change orders, which is going to increase the cost of the project. Um, I understand that there's some contingencies put in place and some potential um, speculated inflation but I agree with um, what other people have said that that's not really a realistic number. There's no way to know how much something's going to cost until it's done. Um, another men, I have a one year old son at home as well. So I just started paying attention to some of these things um, in preparation for my son to be entering the school system. Um, I grew up at in Ashford where they do have a pre-K through eighth school. And as far as if that is a possibility um, of that happening, there was never an issue with the younger kids being around the older kids. The engineers would and architects would design it in such a way that it would probably be in completely different wings. There was never an issue on the bus. Um, I'm 32 years old, so it wasn't that long ago that, I mean, maybe for some people might think, okay, well, that was, you know, 25 years ago, but that was never an issue. Another comment that I wanted to make was, you know, now that we went through COVID, I think a lot of people really saw the impact that teachers have on our children. And I understand I have a one-year-old and I didn't necessarily experience that yet, but I don't think that infrastructure and technology make the teachers, if anything, you know, our kids these days are relying too much on technology. And I know that we have to keep up with the times, but I think we're in a society where we're comparing ourselves to other people and debt has become normalized. And I don't think it's normal, especially for a town of our size and for the type of people that are in our town. I'm not gonna call people poor, um, but we do have to be, um, understanding of what our town is and who makes up our town. And I think that it is interesting if we do have a committee um, who says like, hey, what's the plan for Willington? We just turned down the warehouse, but we can't have our cake and eat it too. How are we going to get families to come to town? How are we going to get, do we want more families to come to town? Because with families, it's expensive to pay for those families to be here, to provide services. How do we get smaller businesses to come to our town? There's development coming. Like I said, I live on Lushan. So I would be in between the potential new school. They just, the traffic has already increased substantially from even down old South Willington. The, the kids are ripping it up with the dirt bikes. Um, ever since that there's a house been built where the dunes are, if anybody knows what I'm talking about. But now on the other side of town, they're developing that and we're right next to Yukon. Um, what else did I wanna say? Steph also had made a comment that she had mentioned every now and then people are gonna face an increase in utility costs. And I don't think that's something that is accurate to say. I mean, I just found an old electric bill that I had from last year where I was paying six cents a kilowatt kilowatt from Eversource. Now it's 25 cents unless you shop around and maybe you can get lucky and pay 14 cents. And I think that with the green movement, not to go out on a rant, but they're going to, it's not going to go down. It's going to increase or stay the same. It's not just randomly that people are going to be paying six bucks a gallon for oil. It's not just randomly that people are going to be paying 25 cents a kilowatt for power. Um, so I think these are all things to consider. I'm kind of torn between, I understand we want what's best for our children, but maybe we should consider taking some of that money and increasing salaries for the teachers who are impacting our children, not you know, making sure we're competing with Mansfield. We're never going to compete with Mansfield. We're two completely different towns. We're never going to compete with Tolland. We're two completely different towns. So those are just some comments I wanted to make. Um, I'm kind of on board with just fixing what we have. And maybe I'm old school that way, but I don't think getting into a bunch of debt. I mean, this debt isn't even counting all the road work and infrastructure. We just paid for that software that Troy's been using for the department, or he hasn't been doing it, but for the Department of Public Works, all the roads that need to be fixed. That's not included in the mill rate. All the CIP things that are coming to fruition or potentially 
that's not included in the potential mill rate. I mean, it's just, we wanna figure out, and I don't know how, because there's so many different people and so many different opinions. I understand that, that it's a double-edged sword that you know we want to fix these issues and we have issues, but nobody wants to pay taxes. I get it. And I understand that's really hard. And I do wanna be positive and commend every, there's a lot of different moving parts involved with this. So I just want to say thank you guys and thank you for allowing us to voice our opinion on this. Thank you for your comments. Okay, next on the list, uh, Elena Testa, and unless someone pops up online, uh, Bill Bernal. Elena Testa, Well, I would like to make a couple points. I'm not gonna to touch technical questions, which were covered already very, which were covered very well, the technical questions here, so I don't want to repeat anything. I would like to talk from the side of the family who is, thank you Lord, standing very well financially in this town. My family can easily afford this increase in taxes. Um, my children never used public schools for the reasons because it was not enough what we wanted to give to our children. Uh, my oldest daughter, our oldest daughter now graduating UConn, excellent, is the youngest, is in private school, is in national sports, national level competitive sports. Not because we have consistent gift in them, but because we wanted it for our children and we were able financially to give it to them. But I never asked, I would never ever would like my children to participate in expensive sports or attend some schools when the old people would, would not have food at their table. Never ever, because that's not a blessing. We cannot bless children or some part of the population, let it be, 5,000 we are blessing and sacrificing 100 people taking the food from their tables. That's not a blessing. Please, I want you to look at it, not from the technical points, but from the points of love. How can we say that these are more important than 70 years old? How can we do that? Then what's the value of our society? That's my number one point. And my number two points, uh, which was touched already, but I wanted to cover it. I know most of the people on this board and they have a high respect, literally a high respect to people on this board. And I don't know who is responsible for these two flyers which we receive. Um, the cost, the estimated cost, as Donna could mention before, so I'm very happy that she mentioned it, I wanted to talk about it. It's totally misleading. When I looked at it, I thought, well, that's not too bad. I wouldn't feel guilty to increase taxes for this. Then I made calls and figured out that, boy, that's double of taxes. Never, excuse me, that's me. But I have a high level of economical education. So for me, that, that did not communicate correct information. Not talking about the majority of the people in this town. You mentioned that there were a lot of meetings and they are highly appreciated that you held those open meetings. But you also mentioned that attendance was very low at those meetings. So most of the people have the information coming out from these flyers and they are misleading. They are not afraid. Where is responsible for these flyers? Um, I would say, I don't know who is responsible, but they are extremely manipulated, including the first flyer which we received, where it says advantages and disadvantages. I can easily add to what's disadvantages 15 more and to the, to the opposite advantages 20 more. So, this is manipulation and deception. And they, I'm not saying that somebody is at the board is responsible, no. But I would like the board, before you release any information, because that's all your face, and they know whoever is responsible, it, it puts shade on all of you. I would like you to be more careful with the information which comes out to the town, which is 
every family. If people go to the meeting, it's all clear. But when it comes to your home, that's already a different situation. Thank you very much. And again, I wanted to say thank you. I know that being on the board, I was on the board of education for four years. I served for six years as now. I just designed. But um, I know it's a lot of volunteering time. It takes a lot. So I would like to say thank you personally to every person who is on the board. And I did not want to put dirt on you. That's not my purpose. I just wanted to say that be a little bit on the lookout what comes from your name, because it's your name connected to this life. And every normally thinking person sees it. And then the town fills up with gossip and unhappiness and hatred. And I would like our town to be filled with love. So just please be careful about it. And thank you, everyone, for doing what you are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, Bill Bonanno, Bonnell. Good evening. I'm Bill Bonnell, 12 Rowe co um, Thank you very much for the effort that this committee puts into this huge project. I appreciate it. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'm wondering why the percentage of re reimbursement changes so much between when we use uh, an auditorium and not an auditorium. It seems to vary by a significant percentage. It almost seems like we're being, being penalized for adding the auditorium. In, in actuality, we are. Um, Mr. Stevens could talk a little bit in more depth about the uh, how the percentage of reimbursement is calculated. One of the challenges is the state guidelines that we're forced to uh, adhere to for the student enrollment projections that we have. And um, some of the core facilities um, that come with any school, things like a cafeteria, um, back of the house and stuff, is kind of fixed no matter what your student population is. And because our enrollment is where it is, and, and Bill will probably correct me if I, if I say something incorrect here, but um, they will allow an auditorium for half the student population. The ed specifications that this committee was given wants an auditorium that will seat the entire student body. That comes from the Board of Ed. We did not generate that. Um, there are other aspects, uh, particularly with uh, reconfiguring uh, or fixed extension of this building. Um, we have fixed spaces. Um, they're extraneous spaces. They don't qualify for reimbursement. And the state has um, this rather convoluted laundry list of items that don't qualify for reimbursement and the fact that we've exceeded the square footage that uh, their guidelines say for our school, uh, we get penalized on the reimbursement percentage. And I hope my explanation makes sense to you. Um, I, I, wish, I wish we were Stanford because I just saw one of their schools going through the state process getting 80% reimbursement. But Willington doesn't break with this. So I hope that helps a little bit. One of the things I looked at uh, was what the state reimbursement was for different towns. And it seems like for the more uh, more affluent towns, they actually get a little bit less than we would. So then I misread the, the chart. I did it while I was here. I'll, I'll, I'll just just put a pin in that. Well, no, I mean, I, I, I'd like to speak to that because I just saw something. Um, there was a newspaper article a while back. Bob Duff got a... Um, I think it was a 60% reimbursement guarantee for 25 years for Norwalk and Stanford. And then on the school list, um, the, the bonds that are in, the, in have been submitted to the state to be acted upon. Uh, I think there were two schools that were uh, listed in Stanford that had 80%. Well, it is the Gold Coast. Yeah, yeah. And we're, we're the Black Film and Black Sheep of the state. Another question I had was, um, do we actually need to add a new auditorium to the Hall School? Could some way, some savings be achieved by keeping what you have, you're all sitting there. 
to build around it. One of the options for Hall, and I don't know if you've looked at the floor plans. I have. Okay, there were two options. Uh, and, and one of the things we're looking at is a cafe gymatorium combination, and it would blow out the wall behind you to a cafeteria. And um, I think the corridor space, I don't know exactly what's on the plans, but I, I think we're close. But it would be combined space with movable um, soundproof partitions so that we could expand this space to accommodate. That is one of the options that we go with. Because the new auditorium seems to add about six or seven million dollars. Six to seven plus, depending upon which configuration you're looking So that would be a significant savings if you could somehow rework that where you didn't have to add that six or seven on top of whatever you're going to do here if, if we were going to refurbish this. First thing, for sure. Um, the last thing I have is, is there a global view of the future town expenses, schools, fire departments, town office, public works, and how does this school expense fit into that? I'm going to ask Ms. Machinsky to talk about that. It's a very good question. It is a good question. I think it's a question that has been asked for many years. We can speak to the last 13 years I've been either a member of the Board of Education or as your first select woman. And, and I think we have addressed that. We have addressed that repeatedly. The um, both fire departments would like either a new fire department or an addition based on um, their needs. There's an obvious need to repair roads and maintain those roads. And, and our schools need to be in that comprehensive plan, but we don't have one. And CIP has been discussing um, for many years that we have a board of selectmen to have a longer range view than just a five year capital improvement uh, plan because we can see it's not, it's not enough, right? But, but at some point, all of those things are going to culminate with increased costs. I mean, we're scrapping to buy a new truck for public works, right? That was a big deal a month or two ago. So, if we're looking at scrimping for $100,000, $200,000 here or there, we've got to take a much more practice eye looking at what this is going to add to our other expenses that we have so many older infrastructure, your town office building, uh, sewer repairs, septic repairs for the town office building, $150,000. And I know that some of that money is grant money, but we're going through a lot of money. and. I'm wondering just how this long range effect is going to be on the overall, you know, the global economy for the town, because there's a lot of other good points brought up here. There's a lot of senior people. There's a lot of people that are below some of the economic, you know, um, vibrancy points in the economy that live in this town. A lot of people might be at or below the poverty limit. So I know that we need to bring in more people. But another person made a good point. Wellington is not Mansfield. Wellington is not Tallinn. It doesn't need to be either, because there's no there's no reason to compete with each other. What you should do is bring, you know, your character and, and your own benefit to the picture, and that's what's going to make up. That, that's what makes up the beauty of this whole region, this whole county. And I agree with that. So what I want people to know is this committee isn't um, working in the direction of trying to be Tallinn or trying to be Mansfield. This particular project is culminated from a discussion of how do we handle increasing operating costs in two buildings with a decreasing enrollment at the time. And, and that's, the, you know, we're faced with how do we handle two aging buildings? And as a town, we have deferred maintenance, deferred uh, spending on, on many things, road maintenance, school maintenance, all of our infrastructure. And, and we need to address them. We can't do them all. The reality is we'll hear people say that a center school will become a town hall. That's great. Is that something we can afford? Is that something that's been decided? The answer is no. Um, would it be nice use of that building? Absolutely. Do we know if we can afford that now? The answer is we don't know. And we don't know if that's what the town wants yet. That's a bigger discussion to have. Um, and, and that discussion we have when we know what we're doing, what we're doing with our schools and what is available to the town. Uh, but just because someone might say they want it or that it could be used doesn't mean that the town 
and, and the townspeople have this choice, whether it's this choice or repurposing a school, all of those dollars are going to come back to a vote of the townspeople. So make no mistake, you're sharing your opinions so that this committee um, can make a vote on which project to send a referendum, and then you get to vote. But so the ultimate decision is going to be on every single taxpayer in this town. Great, and I apologize if it sounded like I was attributing I the comparisons to other towns to your committee. I wasn't. I was uh, thinking of what I had heard for comments previously in this meeting. And no, I didn't think of that. I just wanted, okay, to say, I just wanted everyone to be sure yeah. that they understood. You're certainly not trying to be sure. in that field. I appreciate that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Melody, let's go. Hello, good evening everyone. My name is Melanie Kutsko. I live at 91 Kutsko Road. Um, I pretty much lived here pretty much all my life. My family's been here for four generations. Definitely love Wellington. I will also make this very quick because I think we're all very tired and I know at least my butt hurts, so I don't know about anybody else. But what I wanted to say is I am all in favor of the new school. Um, I think it would be absolutely fantastic if we could actually have an auditorium as well because given this situation, clearly we could use one. Um, my defense for that is I do not want to see Wellington become the dumping ground of truck stops and distribution centers. I want to see this community grow. And one of the best ways to do that is with a new school. Um, I know I said that people said we're not neighboring towns, but I do feel like we need to compete. I think Wellington is a phenomenal place. When I tell people about where I live, they are jealous because it is a beautiful little community in the woods. And I think that alone is enough to bring people. We don't necessarily need to have everything like a grocery store, which would be great, but it, Wellington just being what it is is enough of a draw. And I think moving here with a better school would definitely grow our community, would attract a lot of families. And again, attract families, not distribution centers, not warehouses. So that's my point. I will move on and give other people the mic, but I just wanted to share that. So thank you everyone. Have a fabulous evening. Thank you, Donna. I, I, given my um, 15 years on planning and zoning, I'd like to comment about the idea that having an attractive school brings in families. And it does. I get that. But you have to have a balance of development. Because if you have one family, new house, mom, dad, and a child, what that house pays in property taxes over pre-K to age does not cover the cost that it takes to have that school, pay those teachers, maintain the building. We need the balance of commercial uh, businesses uh, that really goes a long way to defraying the, the burden on the average resident. And um, obviously we had a 1.5 million square foot warehouse that was proposed. Um, property tax revenue from that would have been phenomenal for sure. However, um, the residents spoke on that. That's not the kind of development we want. But if we don't have the balance it makes it very, very difficult to support the kind of school that we would like to have um, without really burdening our residents. And I, I wanted to add that thought just so people understand that um, residential development is not necessarily beneficial to a school system. I'm not saying people should move here, that's not what I'm coming from. I'm just coming from the perspective of the tax revenue generated from that. And we can move on to um, Charles Kearns. Good evening. My name is Chuck Kearns, uh, 248 Town Turnpike. I grew up in town. I'm an alumnus of both Center School and Hall School. I can tell you all the history of what it was, but how they started renovating 43 years ago. Uh, but I'm coming from the aspect of a property owner, taxpayer. I've listened to a lot of good points, counterpoints, but I think with the decreasing student enrollment, 
uh, I think to use up land for a school, uh, and especially in an area where uh, traffic is very dangerous coming out of Adamick, I'm always nervous trying to make a left-hand turn to River Road because of cars speeding on 32 and with school buses going in and out, um, that kind of concerns me. I know a traffic study is going to be done, but I can tell you it's a, a very dangerous intersection. That, the increased mill rate taxes um, with the way the economy is now, with increasing electric prices, gas prices, with no light at the end of the tunnel when it's uh, going to come down. Um, there's just too many things, too many webs, quicksand um, to even consider either one of these two projects. And like I said uh, at a last meeting, I think we should just scrap it and look at the two existing buildings because there is no real plan on what to do with center school. There's been talk of it, but I think there should be a full plan if this new school is to be built. Center school, the main building was built 70 years ago. The renovation was done back in 1980. Um, this new school, this proposed new school is supposed to be finished by 2026. So you add 43 years to that, that would be about 2069, 2070. Most of us will not be here, but the people that will be here will have to deal with the same situation as what we're dealing with right now. Buildings will deteriorate, buildings will have to be renovated. It's just the cycle. Um, I think that we have a working building that may need some TLC, will always need some TLC over a 40 year period. I hate to see land wasted. I hate to see taxes going up. And I don't feel that either project is gonna give us quote unquote the most bang for the buck. Um, I, think, I think the two options really should be scrapped. And I think we should look at actual repairs. And then my understanding with, with the roof project that was dealt with a few years ago, that there was a state reimbursement offer, but because the, uh, I guess the decision wasn't made fast enough or something that affect the state, hold their offer. Maybe if there was some negotiations with the state to see if they could reimburse us for roof repairs and other things that need to be repaired to keep the two buildings as it is. I think that could be a viable option if you work it right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Diana Shane. I'm sorry for making your voice long. Um, I'm Diana Shane, 241 Jared Sparks Road. And I do do want to say that I, I was misled by the um, amount of the property tax increases because, but the way it sounds, like in the example of if your current price is 3100 and then you add all those amounts, you might, it'll go up a thousand, which is about 33%. So I don't quite get the doubling of property taxes. Um, but the other thing I think that's missing from the analysis is the investments that would have to be done in the schools. You know, the mill rate may go up because of, if we just stay in the two schools as they are, there's gonna be costs that are gonna have to happen. We saw that $19 million or so, um, maybe you know we'll have to figure out how to spend that if that would happen, but something would have to be spent. So there will be a mill increase. There could be a mill rate increase even if we didn't go with the new combined school alternative. That's a key thing people need to know. It's not like it's going to stay the same or it'll go up. It will go up even if we don't do this. And having the good you know, the new technology, the new school look. You know, I heard um, the presentation about the, all of the, the way school should be today. You can't do that with these buildings um, the way they are. And comparing it to classroom where someone is in all day to this gym, for example, well, you don't necessarily need windows in the gym, but we're talking about classrooms and plugs and, and all sorts of technology 
you know, the Disabilities Act issues. So. Um, and one other thing I would like to just mention is, at the moment, I would say going with the auditorium option just seems like that's too much. Um, going with the new school combination or the alternation uh, alteration would would be a little bit more affordable. And you know, and I know what there's talk about an auditorium could be added in the future. This gym auditorium kind of concept or the cafeteria auditorium concept. I mean, it might just be something we have to live with. Um, and I know the school board committee has gone through a lot of thought and trying to minimize the cost wherever they can. But these building projects are expensive. Um, again, whether it's the, in, in, in all of these situations. And I can't say I, <laughs> would have a recommendation at the moment for what I would say for the new school the alteration. The new school sounds a lot easier to do, um, but I'd imagine there's also gonna be, you know, someone that maybe the vote would be new school, but something could happen with the property. And if some, if I would, you know, would the, the committee relook if it turned out it was totally uh, too expensive to go with the public water option for, for example, once the road studies were done and all the traffic studies, I would imagine that some, you know, the estimates while they include some of that may become prohibitively expensive. Is that the kind of thing that the community would have to relook at if once those things happened, if the decision was made to go with the new school? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, I again I appreciate everyone's work on this. It's you know a major um, project, and lots of time for everybody. Um, thank you for all the information and the opportunities for people to listen and find out, and go online and see the details. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one comment that I would add here, just coming at this from the perspective of, the, of an engineer and a lifelong resident, uh, sometimes. Easier and cheaper isn't necessarily better. Um, that's my personal opinion, and that's not uh, necessarily that of the community. I have two Farrars on here, and I really can't read the first one. One is Kirsty, and the other, Frank. Frank goes first. Frank Carr, 22 Angela Lane. I would like to make a few different points here. As someone who's attended Williamson schools my entire life, um, and I say with full confidence that it is definitely time for a new school. I remember having to put trash bins on our desks or on the floor next to us to catch the leaks from the ceiling, or having to avoid permanent stains in the carpets that have been there for years in all of the hallways. The school is very old and very run down, and it is simply impractical to fix up this school and keep using it. A new school may be hard on some of the Willington taxpayers, but overall it is so much more beneficial to all of us and the kids who go to Willington schools to build a new school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kirsty Farrar, 22 Angela Lane. Um, I have lived in Willington for about 20 years now. I actually moved here as a new UConn faculty member because it's awesome here and I wanted to raise my family here. So that's something that I'm very cognizant of. Um, I also just want to thank the committee. You guys have put in so much work and you've been so transparent and I really, really am appreciative of, of everything that you've done. Um, I solidly support building a new school. Um, to Rain's point, these facilities really need a lot of work, and I strongly suspect that if we were to start digging into the walls here at Hall School, we would find a lot more work that we don't even know about. You know, we've got roof leaks, we've got uh, the girls' locker room being useless frequently because of sewage backups and things like that, constant HVAC repairs that are needed. The facilities are just too old. 
Um, and of course, I'm concerned about our town's senior citizens as well. Uh, my father is a fixed income senior citizen who lives in this town. Eventually, um, and, and the more meetings that we have like this, I'm closer and closer to a senior citizen every minute. So that's going to be me too. But what I'm really concerned about, though, is the future. I'm concerned about our children. Education is one of the best predictors of success in life. That is how kids escape poverty. That is how kids can have a better, brighter future, higher income. We need to do better than we're doing right now. We need to keep up with other towns around us. You can joke about 21st century education all you want. You can call it a buzzword. I went to school in the 70s and the 80s. Really, what did you need at that point? You needed some chalk, a chalkboard, some paper, and a good teacher. That's what you needed in the 60s. That's what you needed in the 40s. Even, even into the 90s, things didn't change that much. Things have totally changed now. We owe it to our students and we owe it to our teachers to give them a shot in this economy that we live in right now. If we just keep putting band-aids on problems, this is gonna cost us way more money. And I wanna push back against the narrative that this has been the town's fault that we haven't maintained or it's been administration's fault that we haven't taken care of these buildings. Cost increases have been voted down time and time and time again to fix these problems in our schools. That's why we're here. It's not fiscally responsible to throw bad money or to throw good money after bad money. This project is never gonna get cheaper. There's always gonna be a barrier. Right now, I think is the time to build a new school. Thank you. Thank you. I have Samantha Sperry on the list here. I think she was online, so let's skip over that. Melissa Miller. Melissa Miller, I live at 55 Mahoney Road. First of all, I just want to say thank you very much um, for the committee for all the hard work and our town employees who have worked diligently to put this together. Um, but most of my concerns about traffic, that's been huge. I've talked about it at many, many town meetings. I was involved with both truck stops for I don't know how many years. <laughs> um, but that was always a big concern for me. And, that area is so dangerous, just pulling a car out of there, never mind trying to pull school buses out of there. Um, that's one of my concerns about a new school. Um, a new school isn't going to produce better teachers, it's not going to produce better test scores. We need to pay our teachers more. I feel that if we do a new school, we're not going to be able to pay our teachers more, and we're still not going to be able to compete. Just want to touch a little bit on that flyer. I too felt that it was very disingenuous and very misleading. Per Realtor.com, the median listing of a home in the Wilmington area as of December 2022 was $349,900. And Zillow has it listed at $315,407. Yes, it is median, but I don't understand why that card came out with those figures without doing kind of a low range, medium, and high to kind of give taxpayers a better idea of what the increase might actually be. So I kind of just felt that it was a little misleading. Yes, we know that a lot of people don't show up to these meetings. And it's not that they don't care. A lot of people work two jobs like myself. Um, I do take the time to listen online, and I'm very grateful that our town has continued to allow the online options for most meetings. Um, it's very helpful, even if the sound isn't always the best. You know, I heard a lady. <laughs> talking at the town dump to someone else and you know i'm trying not to you know i try to mind my own business but the lady was pretty rude to the person and she was like well if you don't want tax increases you should just move out of this town well a lot of people don't have that option a lot of people don't have the ability to live, especially elderly people or people that are limited um, please make sure you take into consideration that a lot of people in this town are dealing with crumbling foundations, which is a massive burden on them. And then adding a new school is going to put so much burden 
so much more work on them, not just the people that can't really afford it, but those people. Um, you know, I'd like to see more small businesses come to town. I'd like to see our town get together and try to encourage a new bank to come. A local gym, a, a small grocery store. We really need to get together as a town because like Ralph was saying, we can't fix it just by people moving here. People moving here isn't going to provide enough money. It's those small businesses that we really need. Um, also, we don't want to be strapping our children with massive debt to keep up with the Joneses. Everybody talks about competing. Yes, we do need to compete. But if we can't afford to pay our teachers because our taxes are so high and people are going to move out, what, what advantage did that really do? My final point is, has anybody discussed with the folks that are in charge of the trust? What impact will it have on them if we decide to go with a new school? When we give that back to them, what's going to happen with Hall School? And will they be able to afford it? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Donald Ferris. After that, was Brendan Ayers there. Donald Ferris, accepting trust, no Wellington. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, hosting us tonight. Um, I just want to say that you know, you know, after looking at the demographics change over the last 30 years, uh, Willington has actually lost population. And I was wondering what, you know, why are we thinking about building a new school when we've lost population? Um, I went to this school, my father went to this school, my three children went to this school. You, you cannot build a school as good as this today. It's one of the best built uh, schools that I can think of. And it served the town of Wellington very well. You can go across the river to Tallinn, uh, to the Birchwood uh, Middle School. That was a $50 million project that was had to be destroyed and rebuilt again. Uh, you know, a modern school. And you know, things like that happen. This is a, a known entity. We're, we're on the verge of a uh, recession. And why would we embark on a major spending spree like this? It doesn't make any sense. Um, people are getting laid off right and left from, from their jobs. Why, why would this be? on the table. Um, it, of all four, you know, maintaining, modernizing, keeping up, but I, it's so uh, wasteful to take two buildings and just toss them aside when they, they are valuable and they, they should be maintained, modernized, and, and re, you know, keep up with the times. That's what needs to happen. It's a very good school. I just don't see that it needs to be tossed aside. And you know, the Hall Foundation, the Hall family was very uh, forward thinking when they set this aside for the use of the town. And you know, I think it's a, it'd be a travesty to throw that aside and disregard it. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, Brendan Iron. Um, hello, my name is Brendan Ayers, I live in 38 Kimberly, and I want to talk about why we should build a new school, because this school is very run down and has had a lot of troubles. Um, as you were talking about, there's leaking in the ceilings, and a lot of the bathrooms have to get work done a lot on because they keep on breaking. Um, our school doesn't have a baseball field, and they have to take a bus to River Road to play there. And I feel like that's an issue because they, they, they should be able to play here at their own school. Um, also, I feel like we need a new school because it's the cheapest option. And we need better education because our school's test scores haven't been this low in decades. And making people move around 
but just after COVID can make it even worse. And I don't think that's sustainable for education. Thank you. We have run out of speakers who have signed up, but if there's anyone who would care to speak, uh, see one hand or no one up for me? Erica? No one up for Okay. My neighbor. Ex neighbor. Ex neighbor, sorry. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. And, um... My name is Dave Kaczynski, I'm the 58 Ocean Road. Move the mic. Right okay. Sorry. Do a little better. No, I'm Okay. I'll just hold it. And retired engineer, current dog walker. Um, I want to first of all thank all of you folks for your time. Uh, you guys have put in a lot of time. I've, I've watched the, the Zooms and I know how much time. And I know it's been thankless. I know there's been a lot of. Uh, of turmoil, uh, of decisions. Um, I'm not here to advocate a particular choice. I know that's what you guys have to end up at right now. Uh, a couple of things have come through to me, listening to everyone here. And, and the very first one is that uh, I think uh, I think your charge was flawed from the beginning. It sounds to me like folks want more information about the total costs as opposed to just the project itself. It's come, through, it's come through very, very um, clear to me that um, people are concerned that they're not seeing the whole picture. Uh, that's the elephant in the room, of course, is the cost. Everyone knows that. Uh, I mean, uh, who doesn't want the kind of facilities for, for their kids to be educated? In? I think we all want that. Um, it's a case of how do you deal with the main thing? Um, I think that uh, I think you have to include the plans, but if you go if, if you, oh, you have to include plans. To, to address the old buildings. Um, um, I'm married to a 30, a 30 year retired teacher, and she taught in the borough school in Stafford and also in Wick. And take a ride by Hyde Park or take a ride up Prospect Street, and you'll see what happens. If you don't address that up front, because once you let that slip, no one wants to go back and spend any more money on it. It's too late. Um, and you're forced to try to sell it, and it just sits. So that's, that's one of my concerns. Um, uh, I, I guess uh, it's it's, uh, it's important also to uh, consider what's gonna what's gonna happen to, to the people that are on fixed incomes. I think uh, Mrs. Gravan, she had all the uh, all the uh, uh, data on uh, on people's wages and stuff in this town, and it was very accurate. So I looked at myself. Um, it's not a case of whether you have a hundred thousand dollar assessment. It's a case of your ability to pay, and that's really what. It's really what it's all about here. Um, and some folks are, you know, depending on your address, you know, you're on National Lane or, and, uh, you know, over uh, whatever it is on off Batty Road there. Uh, you're probably better position to pay than some folks. Um, and, but not everybody lives there. Not everybody has those incomes. Uh, average income in Olympia is probably household somewhere around $70,000. Uh, and it's pretty tough. What you're presenting here is probably going to be more than, and I heard people talk about, uh, how, uh, you know, it doesn't matter, it's kind of, or they acknowledge it, but kind of keep going right past it. I don't think you can do that. You have to have, you know, more, maybe, a, I don't know, maybe get a little more innovative with, with the approach that we take. I don't know, somehow to cut out the, cut out the bite that, that's, that I'm looking at here for uh, tax cuts. That's really all I have to say. Uh, I could wish you luck. I, I know you have a certain path to work on, and you're going to result, it's going to result in a, in a recommendation, and there's going to be a referendum. And regardless of whether that's approved or disapproved, I think there's probably going to be a committee of some sort in the future. And maybe you can build on it. You've done a lot of work here. I mean, you've done a lot of a lot of foundation laying. Uh, you've got a good handle on some of the costs at least. So maybe there's maybe there's some more here we'll make the other. That's all I'm saying. Thank you, Dave. Anyone else? Otherwise, last call. Don't see any going online. Then I would. Uh, I, I just want to briefly say I, I really hope you set this out again with the word cumulative, cumulative, you know, that this is all maybe put like a total at the bottom of the trial that they know this tax being just the little bits that you see there that's added up. Okay. Important because I think everything's there, it's deceptive, and I 
I was just doing my first seven months as well. And I, I'm very surprised you don't even have it out there. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Just quick with Mary Catherine, this is Marco Rowe. Thanks for everything you've done. It's been eye opening to see the whole process. Um, I just wanted to make a suggestion maybe instead of putting the, the dollar increase, you express it as a percentage. And then that way it would apply to I mean, everyone. You don't have to go through individual scenarios. If you give a link to find out what your assessed value is for your home, you can just figure out what the percentage increase would be. It will be a little bit easier to see, I think. And the other thing I just wanted to mention also, maybe this last gentleman in this book, I agree with him wholeheartedly. I think maybe your goal is to come up with something that's going to pass referendum and not something that you can bring to referendum. So just taking all these comments into consideration, you want to be able to get something to pass and not just bring something to a vote. So thank you. Thank you. Committee member that would uh, love to add some closing comments here. If not, I have a tender motion to adjourn and let everybody go home. So moved. I'll second. I move second. All in favor?